today this is what i am planning for you okay the first one is let me open my notepad here so today we are planning for these topics okay the first one is elastic bean stock okay it's a pass service and then i will give an idea about the amazon storage okay then we will discuss about uh, aws or vpc which is the private cloud thing and then i'll give you an overview of the the security concepts and certifications this is the whole plan for today and in between let's see how much more topics we can discuss okay that's it perfect okay let me just uh, start with the amazon ec2 give me a second yeah so last class so last class we were discussing about the amazon ec2 right so I, I think all of you have a very clear idea about what is ec2 now and in amazon ec2 i just give you some points right hope we discuss these things like instances ami snapshots and we discussed about the uh, how to create an instance how to connect to an instance all these things everything we discussed and hope you able to understand clearly so today today we will discuss about uh, the next topic which is the elastic bean stock okay that's it so let me share you my screen please wait yeah so i am going to log into my aws account here okay as you can see i am going to log into my aws account here i hope all of you are able to uh, create an aws account if you anybody is having some problem just ping me personally i can support you on that no problem okay yeah so let me just change the account sorry we have another account here it's my of my production accounts and team uh, have you seen just uh, here also right when we plan some aws accounts and strategy for a company okay when we plan the aws account strategy for a company i always suggest having multiple accounts can you tell me why multiple accounts are better like for example let's say i have a company which is having different different projects different different you know uh, services running and different different requirements and all so do you know why we have to have multiple aws accounts for that just give me a second okay so i'll tell you i'll tell you so the reason is the reason is like for example if you have a only a single aws account the thing is it's it can always be a the first point is it can always be a single point of failure like for example due to some reason if the account fails uh, maybe the complete company projects can be affected and the second thing is if i want to have multiple projects if i want to have multiple projects multiple teams uh, working in a separate secure environment like as per their requirements and all it's always better to have multiple aws accounts and we have a service called as aws organizations we have a service called as aws identity and access management where we can centrally manage all this okay so don't worry it's very simple so let's discuss that also so as for now i hope you have a clear idea about amazon ec2 so in amazon ec2 we discussed about a few words hope you remember that like for example i told you it's a complete ias service right so amazon ec2 is a complete ia service that means that that means that in amazon ec2 you have complete control over the instances like for example you have a instance like you know what is instance now right you have a vm running inside that instance you can basically have the complete control over the operating system right that means that when i go to amazon ec2 see i when i go to amazon ec2 when i create a instance i have complete control over it that means that from logging on to the instance from managing the operating system from managing the complete applications and the security and everything is my responsibility right but the same time we have one more service called as elastic beanstalk see this elastic beanstalk this service is very much interesting team this service is very much interesting why because it's a pass service okay so i'll give you a practical use case why i have why this service is useful for you so last time some some let's say some uh, two years back one company just give me a call and told me 
Krish, we want to set up a web server in AWS, like we need to set up some few web servers, some database servers and all in AWS. But the problem is, they don't have an AWS administrator in their office. Hope you got my point right. Like for example, that company is, they want to use AWS, they want their complete infra to be in AWS, because they, when they done the cost benefit analysis, they felt AWS is much more better than the on-premises. So, they asked me that, Krish, we don't have a person who is basically uh, providing, or let's say who is having knowledge in AWS here. So we want to have a very simple or easy manageable web server and database server. So that is where I just suggested them this service called as Elastic Beanstalk. So I suggest them the service called as Elastic Beanstalk. Why this service is because when they are choosing Elastic Beanstalk, okay, when the customer is choosing Elastic Beanstalk, the benefit they have is they don't have to manage the operating system or the platform, okay? They don't have to manage the operating system or the platform. That is the first advantage. They don't have to manage the operating system or the platform. Like for example, okay, I am a developer, okay? Let's say their company is having some developers. The developers can directly upload their code to the service without having any knowledge in the servers or something like that. See, let me give a scenario here. So I can click on create a new environment here. I click on this. I just click on web server or let's say let me make it more simple for you. Click on create an application here. See, I go to the Elastic Beanstalk service. I click on create application. I just put the application name. See this, I put the application name as my website. Anything is fine. You put the application name, you scroll down, you select which platform you need. Oh, I select, okay, my application is developed in PHP or let's say my application is selected in Python. I select the application name or let's say platform name. So I want my application to run on Python. I click on Python. I just scroll down. I very simple. I upload my code. I have a code which I already developed for my on-premises. Like I have a website code which I developed. I click on upload the code. I'll upload my code very easily. See this? I'll click on upload the code from this local file. I can click on upload. I can host it. So as for now what I'm doing is I don't have a code. So I click on sample application. So they will upload a code for me. That's all. I don't have to do anything else. I click on create application. See what happens. What happens is, instead of creating the instance, like for example, when you create an instance in AWS, you have to know the networking part very well. You, you must know how to choose the hardware configuration. You must know how to choose the uh, storage. Like you have to know a lot of things. But here, nothing. I just selected the platform. I just selected which, uh, like Python or Java or whatever it is, I select the platform. I selected the application name. I click on run. It's running. See this. So maybe within the next five minutes, I'll be able to upload or I'll be able to run my dev server without any hassle. So they will create a background instance. They will create security group. They will configure storage. They will configure everything for me. This is the advantage of pass service. This is a very simple pass service. You can see this here, right? Please wait. They will basically uh, create it now. So let's wait. Just, be, just see. It's basically creating now. See this? So understand that. So understand that when you talk about the Elastic Beanstalk, it's a complete pass service. It's a complete pass service. In EC2, you have to manage the infra, or like you have to manage the OS, the platform as well, but here you don't have to manage anything. And what? let me give, let me ask you one more doubt team. One more doubt. That means that, so now, let's say, I have choose Python, okay? I have choose Python. I choose Python, okay? But, I didn't choose anything else, right? Like, for example, I didn't choose the hardware, right? So, let's say, for example, my requirements can be very small. But for some other customers, the requirements can be very high. So, in that case, if I don't choose the hardware, how can it manage? Anyone tell me? How can it manage? I didn't use the hardware comp hardware configuration, right? How do they manage it? Anyone? You can unmute and ask, okay? How do they manage it? Anyone? Will it scale automatically? Exactly, that's it, buddy. We have a auto scaling. That means that in the IaaS platform, in the Amazon EC2, you have to configure auto-scaling. Auto-scaling, you have to configure. Like, for example, whenever the requirement increases, 
the instance must be scaled. That is, we have to configure. But the same case, when you talk about Elastic Beanstalk, auto scaling is also pre-configured. So what they do is, they will basically start with a very small instance type. Okay, they will basically start with a very small instance type, and after that, they will uh, after that, whenever the requirement increases, it will automatically scale up, or they will basically automatically add. You don't have to worry about the backend hardware. The hardware will basically works successfully. Is it clear? That is the advantage of Elastic Beans. So, and of course, people say, okay, Krish, then uh, why can't we use it for everything? There are a few reasons why we cannot use it for everything. The reason is, the first reason is, supported platforms. Supported platforms. So, what is supported platforms? Supported platforms means, I'll give an example. Supported platforms means, I go to Elastic Beanstalk, I click on create application. When I scroll down, you can see that they only support these platforms. So what if I want to run some ASP document, something like that? What if I don't want to run ASP? What if I want to run some other language? Not possible, right? So it's having a predefined set of pla platforms. So the first reason is if you're, if the platform you have, or if the platform you want is not available in the Elastic Beanstalk, first reason. The second reason is, okay, the second reason is you want more customizations, more customizations. So basically due to all these reasons, you may have to choose IaaS platform, okay? So basically for all these reasons, sometimes you may have to choose all these platforms, okay? You have to choose the IaaS platform. So otherwise, this is the best platform. Why? Because you don't have to worry about OS. You don't have to worry about anything else. The only thing is, you just upload your code, run your application. So in this thing, only thing you have to worry about is your code. Why? Why? Because if your code is vulnerable, if your code is having some security issues, that can be affected. But any issue relating to this platform or the operating system is basically taken care by the cloud provider. Okay? That is the advantage of Elastic Beanstalk. So that's what you call as Elastic Beanstalk. And it's not easy. very simple team. We can do a lot of things like we can upload the new version of the website whenever we want. See, let me see if I can open that website now. See, my my sample website is up and running, right? So like this, I can upload my core and make my own websites. I can basically check the health status. I can collect the log files. I have a lot of control over it. Don't worry about that. Like nowadays, the cloud providers are basically even have a, a competition about among them on these things. That's why when you go to the AWS platform, you can see all these things are pre-managed, but still you have control over everything. You can basically create alarms. You can basically see the platform running. See, this, everything is working fine. Hope it's clear for you. That's it. Perfect. Okay, and let's say for example, you feel like your, app, your platform is having some issue. You can, you can click on rebuild environment. It's very simple. So like this, they will give you more and more options to troubleshoot also. So you have complete control over it, okay? So it's very simple to manage as well, okay? This is basically what you call as Elastic Beanstalk, okay? But I'll show you one more thing, very interesting thing. So in my platform, in my account, there is no EC2 instances, okay? As for now, in my this, EC, this AWS account, there is no EC2 instances. But when you go to services now, you click on EC2, see what happens. Just give me a second. See, we can see that there is one instance running. So where does this instance came from? You can see that, let's just make it open, please wait. See this, there is an instance running here. So where does it come from? It came from the Elastic Beanstalk. This instance is completely managed by AWS. You don't have any control over it. You control this instance from the Elastic Beanstalk, okay? You don't have any control over it. This is basically the thing which is created by AWS. As you can see, they are, they are using a very basic configuration now. And whenever your requirement increases, it will automatically scale, okay? That's it. So, hope it's clear for you. So, team, any doubts in Elastic Beanstalk? Anything any doubts in Elastic Beanstalk? Uh, Anything? Does it? Yeah, tell me. Uh, yeah. Uh, tell everybody. Yeah. Actually, it, it is giving a little flexibility to the customers. But oh, four years. Co yeah, cost per cost perspective. Does it pricier than the one that See, we manage? No, no. 
it's very very less buddy it's very very less i'll tell you why it's very much less i'll tell you when you go for amazon ec2 instance okay so they will manage like this they will manage this okay you are charged for this particular thing right but the same time when you go for elastic beanstalk there is no additional charge elastic beanstalk is not having any additional charge only the charge you are having for this elastic beanstalk like that instance they are creating the background the auto scaling and the ip and the storage they are not having any other charge so it's far more better far more cost effective far more easy manage manageable when you compare with the normal ec2 is it clear yeah sounds good thank yeah. you perfect others and outs uh, chris is lambda and uh, beanstalk not similar no 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 i'll just give you an overview about lambda now so team there is a service in aws called as lambda in azure we call as functions but it's a basically a, one of the most important things in the industry now uh, we don't have it in the lab ma basically i don't have access now but still lambda is one of the critical things in the industry now i'll tell you why keep your mic on your team so lambda is one of the most important things we can see in the industry now why because there just i'm giving you an idea okay there is a word called as serverless there is a word called as serverless i think some of you know this word this is the industry term now serverless why because see everybody want to manage everything easily right like for example people want to move to cloud because they want to have a easy they don't want to maintain the infrastructure people go to ias because they will the cloud provider will manage the infrastructure people go to apps because they don't even have to manage the os as well so like this yes 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 friends is it is create automatically so basically what happened serverless is there is a new concept called a serverless which is very 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 useful i'll tell you how, how it works let's say in my is the instance or in my elastic beanstalk i am running a lot of things like for example i am having an operating system i am having an application i do my scripting i develop i upload my code i do a lot of things there right but at the same time in serverless there is nothing running it is basically configured and managed by the cloud provider serverless means the, see the word serverless doesn't mean that it is not having any server it is having some server but it is completely managed by the cloud provider so instead of having a instead of having a complete code okay instead of having a complete code or complete platform what happens is we have a code let's say for example i'll give you a scenario so one of my company is telling me that krish uh, we have a website here okay we have a website here so whenever a person is uploading his photo on that okay whenever a person is uploading his photo on that okay photo on that we want to make sure that photo is the size of the photo is reduced to a particular thing okay and that information is sent as a mail to the user so we have two requirements so my company is, that particular team is telling me that whenever a customer is basically pushing a photo to my storage i we have to make sure the photo is resized to a particular size or less than a particular size and we have to send a notification mail to the customer okay this is an example we can in that case instead of deploying a complete server for it we can deploy a serverless so serverless means whenever there is a trigger we call the word call as trigger trigger whenever there is a trigger the trigger is putting the photo or uploading the photo is the trigger so whenever a customer upload a photo the lambda or lambda is basically triggered we call as lambda function so a lambda function is basically triggered so that particular code will do these two activities for us is it clear so instead of running it every time so whenever there is a trigger that particular act that code is activated the code is basically doing these two operations and it is going back to sleep state so will not so it will only run when there is a requirement that is the advantage of serverless it can save a lot of computing capacity it can save a lot of money it can save a lot of time it can be more flexible okay that is the that is called as aws lambda aws lambda so krish if it is a case the lambda function runs from the s3 box or from somewhere else no no that is basically managed by the cloud provider so it is running from a different storage or different compute server in the cloud provider that we will not be able to see so lambda is just a function just some code yes, just a, just a piece of code which performs a single function that's all you trigger it will function it will go back to the uh, normal state that's all you will not see it again 
whenever there is a requirement, it will, it will basically spin up, do the operation, go back to normal. That's all. No, it will not create an infra. We did not create an infra. No problem. Got it? That's all. But still, team, this is very, very impressive. Nowadays, it's getting very hot in the industry now. But most people tell me that just learning Lambda is sort of, you have to get a lot of coding knowledge and all. But you can start easily. Even as in, when you go to advanced cases and all, you have to learn some coding. But still, if you want to start start for a beginning, it can be very easy for you. Not, it is more, not much complicated, first thing. And in Azure, we call it as Azure Functions. Okay, Azure, In Azure, also it's there. But without serverless, companies can't, well, providers cannot be in the market. That's why Azure also is having the same. Okay, that's it. So, hope it's clear for you. Perfect. Uh, Krish, uh, yeah. any kind of uh, basic uh, customization is also not possible in Elastic uh, Bench 4. Uh, yes, it is possible. It is possible for you to customize. Let's say, I'll give an example. Let's say you can see that I have a platform which is running here. See this? In this case, what we can do that, I can basically change the version of the code if I want. I can basically change the platform if I want. I can upload my new code. I can configure the health check. But if you want to manage the OS, it is not possible. It is possible, but it can make you in trouble. That's all. Okay, thank you. Yeah, is it that we will not have visibility of the data? Like, uh, you are providing the code, Vinita. Vinita, you are providing the code. Let's say I am providing a code to Lambda. Okay, I am providing a function to Lambda. And Lambda will do the operation. Like, for example, you are, you are telling Lambda by a code that whenever a user do something, it triggers some action. Okay, so you are uploading the code and that is basically run by a Lambda only. Lambda will not run anything else. They don't have a predefined code. Yeah. Perfect. Yes, Arun, tell me. Um, just um, can you quickly compare the pricing part of Lambda and Elastic Bean? No, no. So we cannot compare Lambda and Elastic Bean, but I'll give an example. Let's say AWS uh, uh, Elastic Bean stock pricing. I'll show you where to calculate the post and all. See, see, there, this is the best part. There is no charge for Elastic Beanstalk. This is the point I want to stress more. There is no additional charge for Elastic Beanstalk. Okay? Like, you don't, you don't have to do anything else. You, you trigger an EC2 instance and some S3 bucket for log files. So basically, when you trigger all these things, you charge for this only. Like, for example, okay, I'm telling you that. I'm telling Arun that. Okay, Arun, please make sure to run a, I, I want to have a server. So what you will do is you go to the AWS instance, you create an instance for me, you do manage everything and I pay for the instance only. Like the same way, if you do it in Elastic Beanstalk, then only the cost is same. The only difference is you don't have to spend your time on managing it. It's very easy for managing. Is it clear? Yeah. Uh, yes, Thank please. Uh, please. Uh, one thing that yeah. according to my knowledge, uh, the okay. Elastic Beanstalk uh, is something like it's a platform and uh, Lambda yeah, it's a is yeah, exactly. And the Lambda is just an instance which is running in between that uh, any kind of platform, right? Yeah. Uh, so see, if anybody wants see, to... EC2, no, no, I'll tell you that. EC2 is an instance, okay? This is basically a e EC2. So inside EC2, mm -hmm. okay, this is EC2. This is an application is running. This is what you call as uh, Elastic Beanstalk. And inside this, we can say that we have a piece of code running. That is basically Lambda. Exactly, yeah. So that... That one, Lambda can be run in, in, inside of any platform. Like yeah, that. exactly. Yeah. Where you don't have to worry about the platform. Yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so oh. Lambda triggers the code users. To, yeah, of course, yes. Like, for example, yes, Devin, like Lambda is basically uploading, uh, sending a code to, uh, you are basically uploading code to Lambda, and Lambda will basically run that code only when it is triggered. And you only pay for the trigger. You don't have to pay for a complete server. Like, see this. AWS Lambda is having a free user tier includes 1 million free requests per month. So whenever there's a trigger, it will basically execute it. That's all. It will not run or you are not charged at any cost. Only thing is, when there is a trigger happening, when there is a buffer happening, you have to pay for it. Nothing more. It's very easy to manage. And that is why a lot of companies are basically moving to Lambda. I have seen a lot of companies like uh, Intel, Capgemini, EPSC Global, uh, Microsoft also basically a cloud guru everybody's a cloud guru is completely running on lambda So all almost all these companies are running on lambda because they can manage the cost very much uh, very cheap 
or let's say they can manage it very effectively like this. That's fine. Okay, that's it. So let's go to our storage part. And team, one more thing, uh, make sure you fill the feedback form. So those who fill the feedback form will get the certificates and CP points. Okay, please note that. You people, when you once you fill your feedback form completely uh, you, uh, with your proper name and all, you'll get your feedback form or you'll get your certificates and CPs in the email. Okay, that's it. Uh, sir, I just joined uh, five minutes late. So uh, no, no, where, uh, no where will get the where? No, no, no. I'm just asking where we'll get the feedback form. We'll be sending the recording, right? You're no, no, uh, the feedback form. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just asking. You will send it. Yes, yes, I'll share, I'll share. No problem, I'll share. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, let me discuss one more topic which is not in the curriculum. I just want to, uh, I don't want to miss that, that's fine. Because we are basically having this for a lot of things. So team, one more service I'll discuss in compute, just for my clarity, like sale. So we discussed the EC2, which is an IaaS platform. We discussed Elastic Ginstop, which is a PaaS platform. We will discuss LightSell also. LightSell is also an IaaS platform, but it's a bit more, you know, simple like for example i'll give an example uh let's say i have a guy who is managing the aws okay i have a guy who is managing aws and this particular user don't want to have much hassle like for example i, I run a company i don't want to manage all the instances in a very complex manner or i may not have all the skills which is required for managing the amazon ec2 so in that case if you want to have a lighter version of it if you want to have a very light bit lightweight version of it you can go for a service called as light sale so light sale is also an IaaS service but it's a bit lightweight it's a bit very simple very clear version of the amazon ec2 but don't expect all the options in amazon ec2 in light sale is it will light sale you can just compare it like this like for example amazon ec2 is something like a ferrari and light sale is something like a normal vehicle car that's how that's the difference so that much featureless is this but still it, it can give you a lot of things even i also right i also i currently run a scenario which is having some 70 servers or 70 instances so out of the 70 instances uh, some 30 servers are running on light sale because i don't want to manage it i don't want to have more hassle on that that's why so let me show you that so if you have a very simple requirement if you have a very simple requirement you can go for amazon light sale okay if you want to have a very simple requirement you can go for amazon light sale okay that's it so i click on create instance here the technical terms are very much uh, uh, easy to understand that's all it's nothing more nothing much complicated okay nothing much complicated so what happens is i select create instance okay i select create instance i select the region i want so i said i just discussed about the region and all last plus so region is basically the location where you want to host your things i am choosing mumbai as basically it's near to me I am choosing Mumbai. So I select the location where I want to host the instance. I scroll down. I select the platform I want. It's very simple. They are giving it straightforward. There is no complex thing called as AMIs and all. They will ask you, do you want to use Windows or Linux? Because uh, this is not for people who is working in AWS. Those people who is not familiar with AWS terms can also use this. So do you want to use Windows or Linux? Let's say I want to use Windows example. Or let's say I want to use Linux. I click on Linux here. I scroll down, then they are asking, do you want to have a Linux OS only or do you want to have a Linux OS with something pre-installed? It's very simple. Okay, I'm telling them that, okay, I want to have a Linux which is already having WordPress pre-installed. I can do it both ways, no problem. As when I'm selecting, okay, I want to have a Linux instance where I can have a WordPress pre-installed. I click on this, I scroll down. This is the best part. See, one, two, three, four, five. Six and seven. So we have only seven hardwares here. Seven hardware configurations here. And there is no complex pricing confusions here. See this? It's very simple. If you want to run a server which is having 2 GB RAM and a single core CPU. Okay? It's very simple. If you want to run a 2 GB RAM, a single core CPU and a 60 GB storage, go for this one. It will give you $10 per month plus tax. If you want to have a 8, 8, 8 GB RAM and dual core CPU and 160, 160 GB hard disk, go, you'll get us $40. So like this, it's very straightforward, nothing more. It's very straightforward. So as for now, I'm selecting a very basic hardware configuration here. Yes, yes, really, you can collect that, no problem. 
and whenever please will be share to all people okay don't make it to person only okay thank you so yeah, Chris, can we can we import uh, the vms like uh, windows vms from light sail from light sail tc2 uh, no 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 from uh, let's say a vmware workstation image can yes, we import it possible like possible that? that's possible yes okay so here what i'm doing is you can see that i am selecting a instance which is very basic uh, 5 columbia ram one or single core cp 20 gb hard disk i'm selling so it's very very cheap 3.5 dollars per month i click on this i scroll i put a name for my instance let's say for example wordpress server just a very simple name i click on create instance see this it's super cool very simple see this it's done so i don't have to worry about the complex and some of people might people tell me Chris, basically i don't want to log into the you know instance every time using putty or any complex tools i basically want to log into the servers very easily so light seal will make it very simple see whenever you want to log in it's very easy let me i'll show you that please wait so everything is very easy to configure on this that's all let it start please wait the so Chris, basically, uh, the thing is like uh, it is also equivalent to EC2. Like there is a limitation in uh, OS and the thing that you have selected, right? Uh, like, yeah, in EC2 you have more, a lot more options. Like for example, when you say EC2, you have almost some more than 200 type of com hardware combinations or let's say instances. You have a lot of AMIs. You have a lot of operating systems and all. But here you have only some seven types of hardware a very few kind of OS and all you have limitations but still if you I'll give you one more option so let's say for example it is a new option currently comparatively that means that let's say now we have created this right so tomorrow yes. I want to have something more configuration I can import this to Amazon EC2 if I want later on I can I can just take it to Amazon EC2 it's very simple to do that okay that's it see now it's ready so if you want to connect to it if you want to connect to it it's very simple you click on this Click on connect. See, I don't want to worry about anything else. It's very simple. See this? I am able to connect to it. See, if you get this error, if you get this error, don't confuse. This error is because it is still starting. It will take some time to start. Like for example, some four to five minutes to start. So that this error doesn't mean that it's having some issue. It's very simple. It's not an issue. It's because even if it shows running, the server is basically starting up. That's why it's not started. Okay. Wait for a few minutes, try it again, it will definitely work. Because these services are completely uh, supported by AWS, which can give you a very easy, see, it's up and running now, see this? You can see that, it's basically up and running, see this? You can, uh, you, you have a WordPress pre-installed on it, you have all the options there, you can easily upload uh, your files, you can do all the things you want, it's very simple, Linux. So Ubuntu 16.04, like this, I can install any OS I want. Okay, perfect. So, and also you have a lot of managing options. I click on this. Uh, I can basically see the storage. If I want, I can add more storage here. If I want to configure firewall, I can basically configure the firewall here. So this firewall is basically called a security groups in AWS EC2. Like this, I, if you this IP will keep on changing, right? If you want to have a static IP address, you can click on create static IP. Like this this thing is very very easy and very effective to manage so if you are looking for a lightweight option if you are looking for option which is very simple and lightweight you can go for this amazon light scene okay so let me remove this it's a very important thing whenever you do anything in the labs or whenever you're trying to learn something or in the industry also while you're working make sure once your requirement is over you make sure you remove the remove everything you have to practice proper cyber hygiene so always make sure you remove everything you have created no no prints nothing no you until five ip is free see i am removing it i have to make sure it's removed why because uh, this is how you are getting charged see cost management is very important in the industry that's why i say Whenever you're planning for anything like this, you have to make sure you remove all the unnecessary things. Otherwise, it can charge you a lot. So now let's go for the best part of the training, the AWS storage services, okay? So before I go to storage, any queries team, anybody, any queries, or are you able to understand?
Anything else? Any queries? Anyone? Uh, which button is S3 bucket? Yeah, that's what we are going to discuss, buddy. Because we are basically going to Amazon S3, now storage, that we will discuss all that, okay? okay. okay. Don't worry, storage we will discuss, okay? Storage we will discuss in depth. Okay. So, uh, any without staying, anything else? Yeah, so, if the instance is in shutdown, um, you don't okay. really get charged, right? Or do you get charged? Uh, instance shutdown means, okay, when your instance is shut down, we call it a stop actually. So, when the instance is shut down, you are only charged for the public or if you are having a static IP address, we call it as elastic IP. So, if you have a static IP address, you, are, you have to pay for it. If you have a storage, you have to pay for it, except for the IP address and storage. You don't have to pay for the instance. The cost is very less. Okay. And Sam, yeah, Sam, what happens is, if you want, you can migrate from light sale to easy to, but not from easy to light sale. It is possible, but it can give you a lot of trouble. So it's always migration from light sale to easy to. You will not migrate back from easy to light sale. Okay, that's it. Yeah, anything else? Hey, sure. We are practicing and have created an instance and we do multiple configurations into it. So, okay. if we delete the instance, the whole thing will be deleted? Uh, like, you are talking about Elastic Beans or EC2? I am talking about Elastic Beans. EC2, right? Yeah. Okay. In EC2, what happens is, when you terminate something, it is completely removed. It, it is not at all, you know, it is not at all uh, used, it is completely removed. So, what you have to do is, if you want to make sure there is nothing left, or if or let's, I, I have the scenario where every time team, I'll just tell you. Like for example, let's say today also I have issue. So some some six to seven months back, one of my customer told me, Chris, let, help me create an instance, okay? So basically I created an instance for him, okay? And everything was working fine. So his requirement is over, okay? He told me, okay, you can remove it, okay? So I removed everything. And after some two months, this guy is asking me, Okay, Krish, do you have any backup for it? We need the instance back. We need all the configurations back. We need the instance back. Definitely not possible, right? So in this case, if you want to retain the configuration, if you want to retain the configuration, you can do it like this. You can right-click the instance. You can click on image and create image. If you click on create image, you have an image being created. Once you have an image, whenever you want, you can recreate the instance. Here. Yeah? Keep your mic on mute team. Keep your mic on mute. Thank you. Hey, Krish. Yeah. Uh, is, that, uh, is that image charged? Yes, you are charged for storage only. But that is basically stored in the Amazon S3. You don't have to. It's very cheap. Like uh, you, it will, uh, I'll, I'll tell you. Let's say per month you are getting some in $1 or let's say $1.5 approximate. Less than that. Okay. Okay, how can we completely remove? It's nothing, Sam. Once you once you right click an instance, once you click terminate. So when you click terminate, you, that means that you are removing it. I repeat, when you click on terminate, you are completely removing an instance. That means that it will come maybe within the next 24 hours, it will completely remove from the console also. You don't have to worry about it. After some 24 hours, maybe within one hour also, sometimes they will completely remove an instance. So once you click terminate, once it is terminated, then you don't have to worry about the instance there. Because why? Because it is completely out of control. It's already deleted. Maybe this is this is just a cache only. You after some 20, uh, some, within 24 hours, they will guarantee they will remove it. But now I have seen that within five to 10 minutes they will remove it. And when you stop the instance, stopping means you are shutting down. Okay, that's all. Hope it's clear for you. Any other doubts, team? Anything else? Okay, uh, it's very simple. You have to go to each and every instance, click on that image. You can click on create image. You can take it back up like this. But still, you have more options like creating snapshots and all. That also is possible. Okay. Yes. Uh, I have one doubt. Yeah, tell me. Sir. See, if we create an image, where it will store that image? Uh, the image is basically stored in the background. You will not see that. You can see it here. You can see it here only in this window, AMI window or, and also snapshot window. But it is stored in the background in Amazon S3. There is a service called as Amazon S3, which we are going to explain in detail now. So it is stored in Amazon S3. 
okay okay the, the yeah. image uh, how can we check reinstall it's very simple you go to the you go to the image here you will have image here so let me show you actual image uh -huh. let me show you actual image yes there is we can import yeah, okay, image no problem cool. yeah please wait i'll just click, go to the mumbai region where i have instance running yes there is we can enter okay uh, we can do it by using a service called as aws kms kms key management service see this i have a ami here see this i have a ami here so this ami is the already there so what happens is if i want to create an instance from this i can click on launch i simply click on launch here so i will they will be selecting the ami predefined see this you have this is the hardware only the ami is already pre selected from this instance is it clear okay that's it so that means that you don't have to worry about whenever you want to restore an image click on this actions like you can click on launch it's very simple okay that's it so and we can do a lot of lot more things we can do load balancing with we can do auto scaling lot of things we can do in this we have a lot of options okay that's it so now the next one we're going to study is something called as amazon s3 aws offers a very 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 good storage options which is basically uncomparable which is basically uncomparable with the uh, amazon uh, or any other service why because this amazon s3 okay this amazon s3 is used by almost all the companies in the world i'll give an example we're using netflix right netflix is also using amazon s3 a lot of companies are basically using amazon s3 for a lot of fun purposes okay so like netflix like a lot of websites lot of companies lot of providers whenever you are using any service in amazon i repeat whenever i have seen this whenever you are using any service in amazon or let's say aws i have seen that definitely they will use amazon s3 for some reason so it is very important for you to understand this s3 in a very good way like we can cover the basics and all today itself no problem and uh, if you want you can basically you know go for more and more advanced things like security and all yes yeah, so this image will be able yes yes depend this image will be available as an ami until the user removes it uh, chris i have a quick question here uh, so i have actually an ami Okay. Uh, and EC2, I have, okay. I did not even run for one minute. I just kept it if I need it, whenever I need it. And okay. if I kept it there without running it, then also I'm seeing the bill every month, every day. Okay. It's it's it kept on increasing. So, I mean, I thought it was like pay per use, but if you're not using yes. it, it's just there. They charge you for that. I'll tell you. Let's say I have an instance running. So, if this particular instance, okay. if this particular instance is basically turned on you have to pay for that first one even if you are not connecting to it in the background it's running so running instance you have to pay for it first thing the second thing is the second thing is uh if let's say i am expecting this instance okay you have shut down it you have stopped it so in yes. this case it's, it's, it's charged charge yeah you have to charge you you are charged for the storage and you are charged for the public ip address so for these two things you are charged okay is there a way to minimize the cost of of these two yes yes i'll tell you so what i this is what my i do basically sometimes some customers tell me that this i want to use a instance now okay let's say for example uh, keep your mics on your team i'm getting some noise thank you So let's say I am getting, I am basically having an instance here. I am basically having an instance here. In this scenario where I am having an instance, okay, where I am having an instance, when I don't want to use it for some time, I want the instance. I want the instance. Even when I want the instance, also if I don't want to use it for the next three months, let's say I want this instance to be running after six months or let's say three months. In that case, you can create an image in Snapshot. You can create an AMI or you can create an image of the instance. Create it and. remove the instance so once you create once you create the image of the instance and remove it after 6 months if you want you can recreate it again from the image right so you will be charged only for the storage of this image nothing more it is very less when compared to all this got it here yeah, yeah, here and how, how how do you create that image it's very simple you just go to the uh, azure console just please me i will show you that Because it's a 400 GB VM, you know that's the problem. 
Yeah, you have you have to pay for that storage and like you have to pay for the storage in a different storage tier. I'll show you that. Uh, and basically, once you've done that, you can pay. You can pay only for the storage. That's all. I okay. click on image, create image. See this. Okay, that's it. Perfect. So oh, just extends and create image, huh? Yeah, that's all. And, and then you can delete this thing, right? Yeah, of course, yes. Even and now also, I'm practicing things. Sometimes, some I said, told some customers saying that they want to have the they want to have the instance, but maybe after three months, they don't have to pay much on the next three months. And why do you create an instance which is having 400 GB storage? This I'll tell you the practical use case. So, team, I have seen that. I have seen. Yeah, no, no, I, I have tell you. Tell you I, don't, I, I have like POC. And when it's okay. POC is needed, then I only I need to turn it on. Otherwise, it should be off for three months or two months. No, why can't we go for? Why can't you go for some other kind of storage? Like for example, use some very basic amount of storage for instance. And why can't you go for some other kind of storage? We have a lot more store options in Amazon, which is more cheap. I don't know actually. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll show you that. I'll show you that. No problem. If you use Amazon EBS or if you use the Amazon storage for this EC2 storage for a long time, it can basically you know give you a lot of trouble. That's why. So let's do one thing now. Let's go to the AWS storage part. You will be able to understand more and more clearly. Okay, that's it. Hope it's clear for you. Perfect. Yeah, team is clear. Compute service is clear, right? Rohit. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Cool. And don't worry. If you have any trouble, I can just share you my information details. Okay. You can just ping me. I can support you on that. No problem. You can self learn also. I can just support you on that. No problem. Only thing is you have to make sure that see when you go to AWS or when you go to any platform. Uh, if you if you just spend some time on all these things, you can easily learn this. The only thing is you have to learn the best practices. You have to learn the way which you can like. For example, if you ask me a doubt, right? Okay, Chris, how can we store it for a long time if you are not you not using it? So what happens if I if I select a lot more storage in Amazon EC2? You have to pay a lot more. There is an option called as cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness. Cost effectiveness means, that, for example, let's say I whenever I am configuring anything in Amazon. Or any cloud provider and anything I have to see that the best option available like for example the storage okay which is the best storage for my requirement which is the best option for my thing I'll give a scenario here I'll give you a scenario here see team I have a company called us allow me images so this company was basically trained by I just trained the team here some years back so they were basically have operations in India also this this particular web company is providing you know I have trained the complete team for them so this particular company is providing photos like for example let's say what I can search give me some uh, context okay let's say our hottest thing in the market now COVID-19 okay let's say if I want to purchase an image they are storing millions of photos okay this particular website is storing millions of photos if they store these photos and everything if they completely store it in Amazon EC2 they have to spend almost 20 times I repeat okay if they are storing all these images if they are storing all these things which they have they have billions millions of images they have a lot lot of images and each of the see they have almost 200 million images and it's basically having more than 50 MT or let's say sometimes 1 GB also size for image if they store all these images in Amazon EC2 instances, by the end, they have to pay almost some 20 or 30 times more cost than their total company revenue. It is not at all feasible. This is not feasible. If they store the complete thing in Amazon EC2 storage, they have to spend a lot of things. That is why they effectively store that they effectively use multiple storage options in Amazon. Like for example, they store all their images in Amazon S3 they put EC2 as a buffer. Likewise, they have multiple services combined together, which will give them the result. Netflix also, right? If Netflix is planning to store everything in the EC2 instance, even Amazon cannot support them. That's why they are stored in a different location. I'll show you that, okay? So now we'll discuss the hottest part in the thing, which is called as the Amazon S3. Okay, Amazon storage options, okay? Give me a second. 
storage storage yeah aws storage options aws is offering a lot of storage options like for example they are offering storage options like amazon s3 glacier uh, elastic block store efs fsx storage gateway a lot of things like that first of all i'll give you an overview of all this then we will deep dive into this amazon s3 things okay that's it so team first of all you have to understand this when i say to when i say the word storage don't confuse that it is something it is some it's a only a single thing storage means we have different types i'll give an example in your computer you have in your in your laptop you have in your computer you have you have a storage starting from your cache memory then you have a storage for, as your ram like your main memory we can say then you have a virtual memory okay then you have a hard disk then you have a ssd then you have a pen drive then you have what do you call the tape drives then you have you know what something like uh, what do you call that like uh, optical like optical storage something like that and then you have then you have something called as this google drive kind of things so like this we have different 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 so we can have sans storages we can have nas storages we have a lot of storages sometimes some something can be permanent something can be temporary something can be slow something can be fast so we have a lot of storage options in our on premises okay so what happens is what happens actually is if you don't know how to utilize the which is the best one or which which is the best one can give you the result by the end you are end up having a lot of cost team i'll give a practical scenario which i have done correct me if i'm wrong okay so what happened was i was basically a trainer for intel for a long time i'll give an example here let's say i have seen that so i was planning to buy a laptop okay i was planning to buy a laptop a lot of people told me a lot of opinions like let's go for this go for that hp is good lenovo is good you know acer is good dell is good like and go for this configuration go for that configuration you buy a laptop only once in a life or let's say once in 5 years get the best one likewise everybody is advising me a lot so when i am purchasing a laptop what is the first thing i have to keep in mind tell me thing what is the first thing i have to keep in mind i am planning to buy a laptop first thing i have to keep in mind our budget seriously okay yes that's also very important yes but still the first thing i don't say it as first thing preparation performance performance no no Not our right. our requirements yeah our requirement right we have to talk about requirement what exactly we need so i'll tell you my reason just listen carefully i okay see all the things you said is necessary but the first one is i have to understand why i buy this phone let's say for example i want to buy a mobile phone i want to buy a laptop i want to buy a motorbike i want to buy a car which one is best for me or what is my requirement first okay let's say my requirement is i have 24/7 job my job is basically 24/7 let's say 29/7 i don't know what happens it it extends actually so 24/7 job and uh, some in most cases i will not turn off the laptop i will basically hibernate it but i have a lot of application money i have i have to run at least some five virtual machines simultaneously okay i have to i have to store some less than 500 gb of things like not, nothing much that's all i don't i don't want to have a drive like dvd or cd drive i don't want to have these kind of idiots i just want to have a binary storage some uh, some let's say 8 gb ram is fine so i gone through all this a lot of people told me okay guys you can go for lenovo you can go for dell you can go for acer all these things you can basically use or let's say the budget they told me is just don't buy a hard disk which is having a hard or don't buy a laptop which is having a hard disk go for buying a hard disk or buying a laptop which is having a ssd so very next moment my budget raised so the second is budget right cost is very important of course so that's okay some people told me go for mac crush what do you want to go for a laptop you can go for a macbook like this book people told me and okay when they told me ssd only okay it, it, it basically raised from the let's say 1 1 one, 1 to 1.2 lakhs it raised let's say 500 gb right then again uh, they told me why do you want to go for 8 gb go for 16 gb so like wise but i'll tell you my problems first of all i don't need a graphic card uh, all these things think for storage only okay i'm just giving you an idea so i don't need a graphic card i don't need this much ram i don't need a system or laptop which is having more than 1 lakh why do i have to buy that so i'll tell you what i done you can correct me if i am wrong 
I bought a normal ThinkPad laptop. Okay, normal ThinkPad laptop. Okay. Yes, Naga. If you if you properly fill the uh, feedback form, you will get that recording and uh, certainly another thing ready. Okay. So okay, you get the, you have a ThinkPad. Okay, I bought a ThinkPad now. And after that, in this I'll see this configuration. In the ThinkPad, I have four GB RAM and a one TB hard disk. For let's say less less than three hundred or let's say four hundred dollars, almost some um, you can say thirty thousand Indian rupee INR. Okay. So after that, what I done is I simply replace the one TB hard disk with a one TB SSD. I replace this four GB RAM with a you know sixteen GB RAM. So totally, it costs around less than fifty thousand rupees. That done my requirement, right? More effective, right? So it can run multiple virtual machines. It can basically run multiple store. It can get the perfect performance I need. It can get all things, right? So basically, the thing I got is just because I upgraded my hard disk to SSD. I upgraded my memory from four GB sixteen GB. So like this. I have customized my configuration as per my requirements. Like the same way, when choosing a storage device, you have to make sure. Okay, you have to make sure. Okay, the particular storage option. Okay, the particular storage option is the best for your requirement. You can go for Amazon S3. You can go for Elastic Block Store. You can do anything, but choose it wisely. Is it clear? So, do I, do you want to add anything with the with the thing I said? Yeah, exactly, Gopashi. You have to make sure. You have to make sure you customize. You take the storage from different different sources as per your requirements. Like for example, in a company, it's not a single requirement. You will get hundreds of requirements daily. Choose, choosing the proper storage will give you proper cost benefit. Otherwise, you are paying extra. It's not the impression for the company, right? That's fine. So this is where we have all these storage options in Amazon, which is called as Amazon S3, Amazon Glacier. Elastic Block Store, EFS, FSX, and Storage Gateway. Let me give you an overview of all this. Okay. First of all, we have Amazon S3. The word itself says simple storage service. Simple storage service. So, what is simple storage service? As a word, it's very simple. That means that. I go to Amazon S3. Okay, I go to Amazon S3, and inside Amazon S3, I can basically, you know. Uh, it's exactly like your okay. It's exactly like your Google Drive. Exactly like your Google Drive. Similar, exactly similar like your Google Drive. What happens is in Google Drive, you put your files whenever you want. You can upload your files, and you can basically address each and every file separately. I'll show an example here. I don't want to show my personal files to you, but still, I'll show an example here. So sometimes it can give you a lot of benefits. Let's say I am taking my Google Drive. Please wait. See this. I have very few files inside this. See this. I have very few files inside this. So let me just do one thing. Let me just open. Uh, back when I can. Okay. Let me open this. Or let's say let me open this one. It is a bit more better. See this. So in this particular in this particular reference, I can basically right click a file. I can get a URL for this file. See this? I can basically get a URL for this file, right? So, like this, for each and every file, for each and every object, I have a URL. I can address. But one thing you have to keep in mind: I cannot modify this file from here. If I want to modify this file, I have to open this file with some kind of editors. Like, for example, let's say I'll show an example here. I click on new. I click on Google. Uh, let's say, for example, I am uploading a Word file. Let, let me show you that. Please wait. You may upload a file here. Please wait. Let me upload a file. Yeah. See, if you want to edit this file, okay, the, this file, if you want to edit, you can click on Open with Google Docs. This is a separate application. This is not provided by Google Drive. It is separate application. This particular separate application will give you option to basically open that file and modify it. Okay, that's all. This is a separate application. But still, in this particular platform called as Google Drive. You cannot modify anything. You cannot basically do anything. You can just upload. You can download. You can make it access to anybody, and you have a lot of benefits. Like for example, let's say my folder, this particular folder is used by more than thousand people. Example, but still also get the performance. 
like the same way you can compare amazon s3 as something like google drive okay we will discuss in detail now so amazon s3 is something like your google drive something like your google drive okay then you have a glacier so glacier it's something like your archive like for example your tape drive is there right? in your company we have something called tape drives for storing the old backups and all so we have tape drives so glacier is like your tape drives so the next one is elastic block store so elastic block store is something which you saw in amazon ec2 so when you create ec2 i'll show you an example here see this tell me if you're not able to understand so when i'm trying to click on launch instance i'm going to ec2 and click on launch instance so when i when i select some os some platform and all here they will ask me to have a storage right see this storage particular thing the storage is basically this is basically the ebs elastic block store elastic this is what you call as ebs elastic block store see this so this is the option this is basically available for amazon ec2 only see this okay then we have something called as amazon efs efs stands for elastic file system okay or uh, previously it was called as ec2 file system now it's called as elastic file system okay so we have a efs so what happens is in amazon efs are you familiar with something called as nfs anyone linux nfs anyone familiar with linux nfs perfect exactly the same thing yeah so in linux yeah exactly we have something called as network file system in linux like don't the name, name is not a bit complex but the thing is very simple okay now that means that let's say for example if i have a server here or i have a linux server here I have some client computers accessing this. Let's say, for example, we have some client computers. If I want to have a shared storage for the client computers, let's say I have a folder inside this, okay, the server. So if I want to share this folder across all these client computers, I can basically use a concept called as network file system. Providing this particular server or storage on the cloud platform is called as EFS. So providing the NFS server or storage server on the cloud platform is called as EFS. I'll give an practical example for this. Let's say we have developers who is working from different different countries or different different locations. If they want to have a shared storage, you can go for Amazon EFS. Let's say if I have some multiple applications storing a lot of files and modifying it continuously, I can go for EFS. If I want to have a centralized share for my company, I can store EFS. Like this, we can use EFS for a lot of things. Uh, so and this, then, uh, that, yeah. NFS is uh -huh. also equivalent to the Microsoft OneDrive. Yeah, of course, uh -huh. we can integrate it also if you want. Yes, possible. Okay. And the next one is, we have something called as FSX. So, this is basically NFS. This is basically a Windows file share. That's all. Nothing more. This is basically NFS. This is basically a Windows file share. Like in Windows, you create file servers, right? The same thing is called as FSX. Windows file share. And... This is something which we call as the storage gateway, which means that in the storage gateway, in the storage gateway, if you want to use your on-premise data center, let's say I have a on-prem, I don't have a use, I don't want to use cloud, I have an on-prem data center. If I want to store some data in AWS only, I want to store some data in AWS, I can basically also use a connectivity option called as storage gateway. No, no problems. We can use EFS for Windows also now. It's possible. Okay, that's it. Hope it's clear for you. Let's discuss the different different options like S3. Give you an idea about S3 and all. Okay, no problem. So before I discuss, team, do you have doubts in the storage options? Like any storage queries you have? Any use cases? Any storage queries you have? Anyone? Uh, Chris, one more time, continue storage quickly. Oh yeah. Yes, and Chris, tell me. Tell me. Uh, the last one use case I didn't get where we are using the storage gateway. Yeah, yeah I'll explain. I'll explain. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I didn't get the use case like the storage gateway. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Let's say for example, I have a data center. So I have all my, this is my data center. Okay, this is my data center, my on-premises, on-prem. So what happens is, in my data center, I have multiple servers here. See this? In my data center, I have multiple servers and storage options. Okay. 
So what happens is when I have multiple servers and store options in my data center, okay, if I want to, I don't want to store all the log files. I don't want to store all the backup files. I don't want to store all the uh, things like that in the on-premise. Like for example, I don't have much facilities to make sure all the log files are secure or I don't have an option to store my backup files or I don't want to store all the images I created in my on-premises. So that in that case, I can use a cloud provider called as AWS. Let's say I am using AWS here. So what I can do is, I say I can basically use the storage gateway to have a connectivity between the on-premises and the AWS platform so that whenever we create a log files, that log files or the files you create in the on-premises can be pushed to AWS. Or whenever you create a, vol a volume backup, whenever you're creating a OS backup, whenever you're creating database backup, all these things you can push to Amazon Web Services. So what happens? So next time if you want to have some requirements, you can pull, up the, pull that file from the Amazon. You don't have to keep the file on-premises. Or let's say I'll give you a different use case. Let's say I have, I have all the files in my on-premises. I want to have the backup of the files in my in Amazon. Then also we can do with the file get storage gateway. Is it clear? Is it clear? Yeah. It's yeah, not a storage, it's a connectivity option. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yes, okay. I got it. Thanks. Perfect, perfect. So that's it. Okay, okay. So yeah, that's what we call as Amazon EF and storage view. So now we'll discuss this particular option in depth. And team, I have seen that wherever you go, if you're using Amazon, this service is the hottest one in the market. Like for example, when wherever you're going in which in whichever in whichever server, yeah, this is basically what we call as hybrid cloud presence. This is basically what we call as hybrid cloud. So what happens is wherever you are going, okay. Uh, in, in if you are using some kind of AWS services, I have seen that in 99.99 cases they are using Amazon S3. Plus for something, for storing log files, for storing something, backup or whatever it is, they are using Amazon S3. So let's discuss that option in depth now. So uh, Krish, tell me one yeah. question. Tell me. No uh, problem. EFS and F, uh, FSX and all those things, they can be okay. only mounted on servers or can they be used just as separate storage like S3 also? Uh, uh, so you want, to, you want to make sure EFS is basically stored, but just uh, uh, centralized storage, right? Yeah. No, is it something which is mounted on an IAS platform only? No, nothing, 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 nothing. Like for example, uh, it's, I'll show you a demo on that. I'll just show you a very simple example. I don't want to completely go through it. I'll just show you an example. See. It's very simple. You go to the services, you click on EFS. You simply create an EFS share. See this, you click on create a file system. You'll get a URL. This URL you can mount to all the client computers. So whatever things you mount, put on the client, client computers will be centrally stored in this EFS share. That's all. Like I'll show you one more example here. Let's say for example. Anything network my... level we need to make because it should connect from all the uh, instances yes, to we, that. We, we can mount, yeah, we can mount it. See, I'll show you that. See this. I have a, so I have, let's say for example, this is my NFS server. I'm not talking about the cloud thing. I'm having NFS server. So inside this, I created a folder called as share. This is my folder called as share. So what happens is I have some computer which is connected to this. Let's say computer one, computer two, computer 3 and computer 4. In this case, what happens is I can basically mount this folder called as share to this computer, this computer, this and this computer. And whatever things I put on this mount, mounting means creating a shortcut. So putting all these things on this particular share, it will be stored in background in the actual this particular folder. Is it clear? The same way you are creating this particular shared folder in the cloud, which is called as EFS. Is it clear, Kennedy? Yes, thank you. Very perfect. It's clear that I don't doubt. Uh, it's only for Linux or Windows. We can use it for Windows also now. We have options for share, sharing the NFS with Windows as well now. It was, it was basically designed for Linux and it's basically working on Linux also. But now we can use it for Windows as well. We have some client software which can help you on Windows as well. So what but we can control that uh, and what is in cloud? Only size we can see or we can tweak the NFS parameters and also? And, and, and the first thing, and the first advantage is no size limit. Like for example, 
it will keep on increasing whenever your requirement is increased. And the parameters you have to configure, you cannot configure the parameters, you can configure only the file permissions, like you can configure the permissions, but the complete parameters like the normal NFS you cannot configure. Okay. I cannot have quota, Krish, on this. Which one? A quota. Can I define quota for Windows machine? Uh, no, no, no. Because basically what I have, no, no, quota is, uh, I don't know that basically. But still, but still I have seen some particular client platforms we can support this LFS now for Windows. Okay. And even, and there is one more thing, Jayant, what happens is, now Windows is op offering Linux as a by default option. Like I'll show an example here, please wait. So let me open my Microsoft store here. So in this Microsoft store, when you, take, when you search for Ubuntu here, let me search for Ubuntu. Now let's say, you can install this Ubuntu client inside the Windows system. See this? No. Okay. Now Linux, Windows is offering Linux inside by default. Let's say if I want to have a Kali Linux, I can install Kali Linux also. Don't have to worry about anything else. See this? Okay. So I, if I want to have, uh, it's very simple now. So everything is there. It's basically everything is there. See? So you don't have to worry about all this. See this? They will take care of everything. Now Windows is also supporting Linux a lot. Even the complete Azure platform is running on Linux. Okay, that's it. Okay. Perfect. Okay, anything else team? Hope it's clear for you. Perfect. Okay. So now what we'll do is we'll go to the best, the first, the main topic called as Amazon S3. So this topic, even if you go to AWS or not, let's say if you're a developer, if you're a tester, if you're an operations guy, if you're a management guy, this particular topic can give you a lot of benefits. That's why. So we'll do, go to this topic in depth. Understand that. Okay. I told you to get a clarity on this. I'll tell you. You can compare Google Drive with this. So both Google Drive or Amazon S3 or let's say Azure Blobs, all these things are something called as object storage. All these are object storage. Don't confuse with the name, okay? When you go for either Google Drive or Amazon S3 or you go for Azure, in all the cases, we have something called as an object storage. This is what you call as an object storage. So what is an object storage? Don't confuse. Anything you put in Amazon S3, anything you put in Google Drive, anything you put in Azure containers or Azure blocks is basically what you call as objects. Like for example, it's very simple. I go to, I go to Amazon S3. Please wait. I don't know why it is taking some time. I go to Amazon S3. I click on some storage. I'll just show, tell you what is this. I basically open this. See, I have put some file to Amazon S3. I can upload any file I want. Let me let me upload a file to Amazon S3. Let's say for example, I am taking this particular file, upload. See, this particular file which I uploaded now is basically called as object. That is basically called as object. So any file you put in Amazon S3 or you put in the bucket, let's say you put in the uh, this one like Azure container or the Google Drive is called as an object. The first point. The second point is, even if I told you that you can compare Google Drive with S3, it's uncomparable. Why? Because the, for S3, there is no limits. There is, in most cases, there is no limits. You have a very, very, very interesting option. Google Drive is, is it just a pump, complete public offering. Like it's not having much security. You don't have a location preference. You have a lot of trouble in this. But at the same time, when you go to Amazon S3, if you are working in an enterprise, okay, if you're working in an enterprise, if you work for an enterprise, if you want to store your data for a business, the best and the secure and the compliance perspective, the best option is Amazon S3. I'll tell you how it works, okay? First of all, understand that in Amazon EC2, let's say we use all storage called as EBS, I told you, right? In Amazon EC2, the storage which we are using is called as EBS, Elastic Block Store. This particular storage, you have to predefine the size, right? Like for example, if you want to use 20 GB, you have to allocate 20 GB. If you want to use 50 GB, you have to pre-allocate 50 GB. But at the same time, in the object storage, it's like the Google Drive, the object storage in Amazon S3, there is nothing called as pre-provisioning. You put your objects, the storage keeps on increasing. You pay only for the storage. You don't have to pay anything else. 
you only pay for the storage okay so as the word says it's a complete highly scalable that is whenever you have a requirement it keeps on growing fully managed you have complete control over it object storage okay that's it and of course i told you there is no limit it's a virtually unlimited storage capacity that means that you don't have any limit like for example okay i put a put a data there is nothing or less it will it will fill up easily you put whatever amount of files you want you put gb tb pb zettabyte in any size it will basically manage it you don't have to worry about the storage the storage will keep on increasing whenever your requirement increases okay and the only there is only one limit this is the only one limit you have each of the file i repeat each of the file we call it objects right so whenever i say objects understand that i am talking about a file okay so each of the object each and every object i am putting in amazon s3 the maximum size is 5 tb is it very less 5 tb your laptop hard disk itself is 1 tb right we have a single file size maximum up to 5 tb you can put a single file size maximum up to 5 tb that's why this is very much better see this you can put your files each file the maximum size is 5 tb like this you can put n number of files there is no limit for the number of files you can put you can put n number of files and you don't have a limit for it the only limit a single file size can be maximum to 5 tb so can we have some files which is maximum 5 tb i'll give an example like for example when you see this disney movies and all right like this animation movies and all right like cinderella those kind of things right so these kind of movies basically the each and every file sometimes can be approximate 4 tb or 3 tb per movie when they record when they record it actually okay so 5 tb is the maximum size of movie they can store or the file they can store okay that's it okay that's it and this is the best part i told you for every object i'll show you the labs we don't explain anything theory everything is in lab only so what are things you put in amazon s3 we can access it from using a particular url that means that let's say for example i put a file we call it subject right so we put a object in amazon s3 and for every object you will get dedicated url i'll show you that see this i have a file here i have a file here so now i have put a file so now just a few minutes back i have shown you that i put this file this particular file is having a dedicated url here see this so when somebody click on this url they can access but there is a constraint i'll tell you that so using this particular url anybody can open this file if you permit right that is the best part so you put the files or you put the files for each file you get a url and using this url you can basically access very easily okay okay so okay devrash it told me a requirement so however higher network bandwidth required to access the files yes i agree with that that is the best part buddy what happens is let's say keep this in keep this in mind let's say we have a file here so you can see this file here right so we have two files here let's say this particular file is currently accessed at the same time by 1 million people example if this particular file is currently accessed by 1 million people okay still also it gives the act perfect performance it will give you the exact performance they guarantee there is no lag there is no bottleneck there is no bandwidth issue so even if a single object each and every object even if it's accessed by millions of people at the same time it will not basically give you any bandwidth bottleneck it will basically work without any hassle okay that is the best part clear avanj is it clear devashi perfect okay so understand that understand that whenever you are putting some file to amazon s3 you don't have to worry about the performance you will get it by default so a customer can store n number of files a customer can get url for each and every file customer can basically store and access the file can be accessed by millions of people at the same time it's very simple okay so the first concept we study is objects the next concept we study is basically called as the bucket this word is very famous actually bucket so the next concept we study is the bucket that means that so i'll give you a very simple example for this bucket let's say 
otherwise it will not give you clarity that's why so you can see my uh, my my computer here so inside this you can see that i have a drive 1 here drive 2 here drive 3 here but for all these drives you can see that i have something called as a drive letter can you store any files in your computer without drive letter can you store any files in your computer without a drive letter like for example i would store some files can i store it without drive letter can i store it outside the drive no we cannot do that i'll give an example let's say even if you store the files even if you store the files and downloads documents desktop wherever it is okay whenever wherever you store the files like this okay all these things all these things are basically in store inside your computer right like for example you have this pc you open the c drive you open the users you open your username so inside this you can see all this so like this a drive letter is mandatory if you want to access something you need a drive letter like for example you have to start from a c drive or let's say d drive inside this you can have a folder or let's say you can have a file like this right so this thing is mandatory like the same way in Amazon S3 also, if a customer, if a consumer of AWS want to use store something, they have to create something called as a bucket. You can compare, not exactly, you can compare this bucket with your drive letter. That means that a bucket is necessary if you want to put some objects. So let's say we create a bucket first. So inside the bucket, we can create n number of objects. Is it clear? That's it. Put your objects inside the bucket. Okay. Let me create one bucket here. I don't want to explain without actual things. So let me create a bucket here. I go to my Amazon S3 console here. Okay. So inside this, I click on create a bucket. I click on create bucket. Give me a name team. Let's say for example, I type the name called as, uh, what do you call that? Microsoft. Just a name. So when I click on create a bucket here, see, it is showing an error here called as bucket name, bucket with the same name already exists. Let me see if I have a bucket name like that. No. So understand that when you create a bucket, the bucket name must be unique worldwide. Whenever you create a bucket, the bucket name must be unique worldwide. Don't forget the bucket name you're creating must be unique worldwide regardless of the region. So let's say if I create a bucket now called as InfoSec Train, nobody in the world can create it again. Like for example, let's say I create a bucket called as InfoSec Train. Okay. Nobody in the world can create it again. See this? Now I have this bucket called as InfoSec Train. If somebody is trying to create this bucket again, they will show get an error. Why? Because I have this bucket. So the bucket name must be unique worldwide. I open this bucket. Okay. I basically open this bucket. Okay, or let me just use another bucket. I don't want to upload more files. So let me open this particular bucket. Okay. Okay. Inside this bucket, okay, inside this bucket, I basically click on upload. I'm just uploading some files. Okay. I click on upload, add files. Let me upload some contents to it. Let me some contents stream. Okay, this picture looks good. And we have some more files yeah so i have two files i'm uploading some image and text file to my s3 bucket so i have uploaded two files aws gpg push the cw logs to easy to like i have uploaded two files okay let's do one thing let me click on this particular file here i click on this file i will get a url here so yes, i'll get a url for this file let me just copy this URL and see if I can open it. So team, just see if you can open this URL. Sorry, wrong, wrong file. Please ignore this. I think it's not copied. Sorry. Don't, it will not open. Please wait. Then Google Drive will not open. That's how you basically information is leaked. So just try this out. See if you can see this, open this URL. Click on this URL and see if you can open this file. 
Tell me, team, anyone? Are you able to open this file? No. No, right? Okay. No. So let me see what I have to showing. Okay, let me see what I have to showing. So I click on this. Okay, it's showing access denied. Okay, perfect. Why? Because let me go to this file here. I click on make public. I click on make public here. See, I click this file make public. When I click on make public, now try it again. You will be able to open, right? So like this, I can basically control the permission of each and every file, each and every content you are basically accessing, right? So like this, now you see this, you go to the website called Salami, okay? You go to the website called Salami, you basically search for info, information sec, information security. Just an example, okay? So how do they how do they get the images? They store the, this company store the images in Amazon S3. Example I'm giving you, okay? See? Basically, all these images are stored in Amazon S3. Whenever a user request for this thing, you'll get this file from the storage, okay? Yeah, let me see this. Let, let's see how much I can show you that, okay? That's basically, you need, you need to study some few more topics, but I'll give you the basic encryption option, no problem. Okay? And you can just, uh, yes, of course. Yeah, that's a very important thing to mean. What happens is, let's say, that is a very important question. So, uh, Dipin is asking me that if I delete a bucket, can I create it uh, once again? Or let somebody try to create, okay, let me remove this bucket. I click on this bucket here. I click on delete. Let me remove this bucket. Info sec pane. Okay. I just click on delete bucket. Okay. So when I click on delete bucket, what happens is, It is still removed. It is deleted. So you can see that it's showing that successfully removed that particular bucket. Fine. Let me see if I can recreate it again. Create bucket. In four sec train. I scroll down. I let me just try to create it. Okay. Create bucket. See, I am able to create. But sometimes you can you can tell me Krish, it was no, I was not able to create. It may be because after you delete, just wait for some 5 to 10 minutes, up maximum 30 minutes, so it will be active again. So, so now it's very fast, so I was able to remove it and create it again without any hassle. But still, if you feel that like you have some issues, or if you feel like, okay, it's showing some error, it's okay. You can wait for some time, like maybe some 10 minutes to 10 minutes. After that, you can create it, okay? Create him. Uh, Krish, uh, Krish yeah. Jayant here. Yeah, tell us. Uh, if the bucket contains a file, then also I can delete? Uh, you have to empty the contents first, then you have to delete it. Like for example, if I want to remove a bucket, first of all, I have to empty the contents first, then I have to remove it. Okay, that's it. Okay. Yeah. And Sam, okay, can we create snapshot for a bucket? No, 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 Sam. Uh, like for example, if you remove a bucket, the data is completely gone. There is no option to take a snapshot. Nothing. The only option is you can create replication. Like for example, you can create one more bucket, which is a replica of the main bucket. So even if you remove the actual bucket, the replica is there. Okay, that's it. That is our snapshot bucket. Okay, that's it. But learning history is very simple, team. I, I, if you want, I can share you the best resource in the, for Amazon S3, no problem. It's very simple for Amazon S3 to learn. But if you want to go, want to go for advanced topics, it, can, it is having like, you have to learn a lot of things. Even me also, right? When I take the AWS certified security specialty thing, this particular thing called as Amazon S3, I, I spend a lot of time. Why? Because in a security perspective, this can basically do a lot of things. Yes, so as we can basically create a one more uh, bucket where we copy all the files, then we can remove the actual bucket. Okay, and we can we can set the permissions who can remove it, who can add this like that. Uh, Krish, okay. what is the best practice uh, while dealing with the buckets? Is it uh, uh, when we are dealing? Uh, is it uh, is it good to have multiple buckets? And the way how we maintain the drives is it uh, is it going to help in the fast retrieval or something like that? Yeah, I'll tell you. Like what happens is I I'll tell you my strategy. So this is just I'm giving an example. I, I didn't go through all the topics, but just I'm giving you an example. Let's say. The, this is the this is the best practice I'm following for the security point. Like for example, I'm a security guy completely. So in my experience, I'm doing this basically. So let's say I am currently managing, let's say 50 accounts. So for, I have 50 AWS accounts. So what happens was, I'm showing all this to my students basically. 
So what happens was I have 50 AWS accounts. So this is used. This is basically for a company. This is for a com client which I am supporting. Okay. So what happens is all these 50 accounts is generating a lot of log files. So what I do is I send all the log files to S3 buckets. So what I felt is if I store everything in a single bucket or if I store everything in a single bucket, what happens is let's say uh, if I store everything in like log files, if I store my main critical files, access files, public files, if I store everything in a single bucket, it can basically give you a lot of confusion. So what I done is for every purpose, I have created separate buckets. Like for example, for log files, I have a separate bucket for um, normal backup files, it's a separate bucket. For images and for public access things, I have a separate buckets. For developers, I have a separate bucket like this. First choice. Then second thing is I have make sure that all the log files from this 50 accounts is sent to a single account. S3 bucket. Like for example, okay, I have some 50 accounts. All the log files and everything from all these 50 accounts will be sent to a single S3 bucket in a particular account. And this S3 bucket is basically replicated to another, another location also. So what happens is even if somebody try to delete this bucket, it is not possible. I have given some security measures. So even if somebody try to remove this bucket or even if somebody try to, you know, modify this bucket, they will not be able to do anything. And also you have a backup as well. Fine. The cost incurred is based on the storage occupied, but not the number of buckets, right? No, no, but still there is, yeah, you can create an, you can create up to 100 buckets in an account without any cost, extra cost. You are, so you are charged only for the storage. You are not charged for the bucket numbers. And, uh, and the next one I want to tell you is, uh, Fish okay, you, yeah, just, just give me a second, Jen. So if you, yeah. pre, if you remove a bucket, okay, if you remove a bucket, there is no way you can get it back. Don't forget that. Like for example, as given asked, okay, you cannot archive or you cannot do anything. If you remove it, then nothing. It's completely done. So if you want to make sure a bucket is safe, you can basically enable uh, a secure deletion and all. So, so nobody will be able to delete the bucket except you, like that. So yes, we will. Jen, Jen tell me. Yeah, uh, with respect to your last example, uh, uh -huh. we have created 50 accounts. Okay, the 50 okay. accounts will be having the same permission on that particular bucket. Mm -hmm. uh, no. Uh, yeah, but basically what happens is. All these 50 accounts will be able to send the log files to this particular bucket. Only the log files. They will not be able to access the bucket or they will not be able to open the bucket or they will not be able to that even means, see the contents inside. That okay. means anyone from the 50 accounts can remove that particular file? And that's what I told you. Nobody can basically, no, nobody from this 50 account can even see the bucket or open the bucket or put the, or do anything. Only thing is the particular log application from all these 50 accounts will be able to send the data to the particular bucket, that's all. Nobody else can okay, basically okay. open it or do anything wrong. Okay. No one can modify it. Nothing, nothing. They can they can even do they cannot do anything. Okay. Uh, well please one thing, those uh, accounts yeah. are considered as an object into the buckets or is it something other? Uh, no no. We have fifty AWS separate accounts. So all these fifty AWS separate accounts can put the contents into Amazon S3 bucket and the Contents they are putting is basically called as objects. Like they are basically log files, like the text and JSON okay, files. Those, log image, those image files and all this, and those are exactly. there as objects. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Those uh, S3 buckets, we can control the IAML, whatever the accounts have the roles, we can separate and these have a particular category, then these can be uh, modified. We can do that kind of control at a S3 level, buckets level. Uh, can I just repeat the question now, once again? Uh, the, whatever the accounts, they have uh, roles and privileges, right? With that uh, okay. privilege accounts level, we can control the S3 bucket, the, whatever the operations on that S3 bucket? Yes, yes, of course, yes, of course, yes. We can control for each and every user, each and every account, each and every identity, no problem. And deeper, okay, how do you set up the replication of the bucket? And sub yeah, it's very simple. You go to the, you go to the logging platform like CloudTrail and all, you can basically configure to send all the log files to the particular bucket in a different account. No problem. It's very easy. You can go to the particular logging application. You can configure to send all the log files to a particular bucket call us. You can set specify the name also. Yeah. Uh, Krish, uh, Jain here. Can yeah, account yeah. be a part of any particular group? So uh, five we accounts are there. Yes, yes. We can make it to a group. We can call it as OUs, organizational unit. We can make it a OU. We can make it a group. A lot of things like that. We can do it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah.
So I am basically giving you a, uh, just overview on this, but still we can do a lot more on this. If you want, if you need any support, just ping me, no problem, okay? And I hope all of you have my number also. If you if you oh. need any support, you can ping me, no problem. But make sure to just ping me on WhatsApp before you call, okay? That's all. So I'll share my number once again. If you need any support, just ping me, okay? This is my number. If you want, if you need any support, just ping me. Don't feel feel free to ping. It's basically uh, a free of cost. Like it's basically sharing more information can give you more more ideas. That's why I don't want to uh, keep everything by myself only. If you want any support, just ping me. Okay, that's it. So let's do one thing now. Let me very more. Yes, tell me. Are you a number? Uh, in the chat box, you can see the chat box, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And don't worry, I'll share my profile information also. I don't want to. Uh, and team, it's like uh, you can just see learning the AWS, learning the cloud, or learning any platform is very easy. The only thing is learn. See, now I told you the basic concepts, right? What you can what you can do is you can basically easily learn this. It's very simple. The only thing you have to keep in mind is you have to understand the best practices. Like when you go to industry, what I suggest to my all all my students is I don't want them to simply learn that they they can do from anywhere, right? But when we learn, when you learn, what I am suggesting is learn the practical use cases, learn a maximum hands-on. So, because tomorrow you get a requirement, you must be able to know which service is the best phone for that. Yes, team. Yes, also you will get the recording for those two days. When you, I will share a feedback link. Okay, by the end I will share a feedback link. And when you fill the feedback link, or when you see it in between, I can share that. If you fill the feedback link, you will get the recordings. You will get the certificate and everything in your mail. Okay, no problem. Make sure you put your name properly, okay? Otherwise, that feedback link will not give you, uh, you know, proper thing. Okay, let me just, uh, please wait. I'll share the feedback link now itself. I don't want to confuse you on that. Please wait. Just give me a second. Just give me a second, team. Just give me a second. Let me share the feedback with you on this. Yes. So this is the feedback link I'm sharing in the chat box. Please copy it and fill it when in the in the break time. Okay, I'll give you a break by ten. By the time you can fill this, so you'll get this, all the information and all. You'll get the recordings. You'll get this, uh, you know, uh, the uh, certificate and all these things inside it. Okay, make sure to copy this link. Okay, perfect. Cool. Okay, so. Let's continue. No problem, Kausar. No problem. You can get the recording. No problem. You will get the recording from that link you are Okay. No problem. And if you need any support, just ping me. It's okay. No problem. Feel free to ping. Okay. So that's the thing. So now you know buckets. Now you know objects. Now you know endpoint. Now you know the uh, bucket name. Now you know the concept called as objects, how to access it and all right. So team, any doubts in this till now? Do you have any doubts in this till now? Anything? Yeah, hi Krish, this is Rolith here. Yeah, tell me. Yeah. Yeah, just regarding one the scalable thing. So the auto scaling before it auto scales automatically, does it alert you that this we are going to auto scale or any warning before it auto scales? Uh if you if you're uh, you're talking about EC2, right? Yeah. Sorry, no, not it is with this S3, like it's highly no, scalable, no. right? So in case if no, no. the S3 no, no, never, never. Let's see what happens is, let's say you have S3 bucket here. You yeah. you don't have to worry about the, you put your contents. It keep on expanding. That's what you call a scalable. You don't have to like if you if you basically put something inside it, it will not show you the alert. If you want, you can set the alert, but still that will give you a headache actually. So every time you put something, you'll get some mail, right? Where do you want to do that? So like for example, the S3 which I've taken is only for the 15 gig. For example, okay. I just want to use the maximum storage of 15 gig. Nothing, nothing called as limit like that. You don't reserve anything. So let's say as you asked, you not reserve the 15 GB. You can oh, basically, okay. you know, yeah, you, you just start with that. You start copying contents to it. There's nothing called as pre-reservation. You don't have to reserve anything. Whenever you want, nice. you can put the content. It keep on extending. See, in Google Drive also like that. But in Google Drive, what they are telling is, what they're telling is, when you put some, the maximum free, you can get is up to 15 GB. That's all. That doesn't mean that you cannot go more than that. You can go more than that. But you have to pay for it. That's all in Google, right? That's all. Yes, of course, I Mahindra. Yeah, if you create a replica, it will be charged. Yes, Mahindra. 
Because basically we are basically copying into a different location, right? Or let's say we are creating a different bucket, right? That's it. So don't forget team, it's a completely higher, highly scalable, fully managed storage. See, this is just a starting team. This is a huge thing. It can give you a lot more advantages. Uh, basically, you can go for EBS in that case. But when it's a single file, I'm talking about, it's not 5 GB, it's 5 TB, right? A single file is basically up to 5 TB. Even, you know, you, even your database backup files also is split up into 1 TB files, right? And usually, we don't have to, we don't basically make the files 5 TB and all, right? A single file. We can make we split up multiple files, right? Okay, that's it. Krish, uh, 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 Jayant here. Jayant. Yeah, basically it is a, uh, as simple as pay as you use, right? 100%, you pay only for your using. Yeah. And, yeah, so and can and I get a report for the usage? Like, what kind of report are you expecting? Like, uh, do you want to have a log, log on that? This is, no, this is the usage. This is my usage per day, per day, per uh, week or per month. Yes, of course, yes. But that for that, you can configure billing and all. Like, for example, you can set a billing billing limit on that and there you can see how much you are using utilized till now. Yeah, okay. that will be better. Yes, yes, yes. But still, but still you can basically set a limit. Like for example, for this particular user, I want him to do it in this way only. Likewise, I can do a lot of customizations and all. So let's say even if somebody is trying to put some files to it and the file is basically having some issues or let's say if it's more than a particular size, you can block it also. Uh, file level copying is allowed. Restriction is allowed. No one should be able yeah. to copy BMP files. Yeah, that also is possible. We can basically create something called as bucket policies where you can do that. Okay. We can okay. have a lot of security mechanisms in this AWS S3 bucket. We can have a lot of things. So that's okay. a thing. That's the fundamentals. So uh, let me give you a few more things. This is basically, see, this is just starting. Okay. Let's see how much we can cover. Okay. Uh, just a few more theory things and we'll show you more and more labs. So as I told you, we can use it for storage and backups. We can use it for application file hosting, media file hosting. So I'll give an example for this, practical example for this. So you see Netflix here, right? So Netflix is basically having a lot of movies. They basically have a lot of files. So if they store all these files in any other storage, the first point is they have the concern about the bandwidth. Second problem is the cost. So when you go to Amazon S3, both can be very effective. Bandwidth is completely managed by the cloud providers and the cost is basically very much cheap when you compare with other cloud when you compare with other cloud services, other cloud providers and other cloud storage types. And even you have one more thing team, one more thing called as different storage types. They have storage tiers. Okay, we have storage tiers. That means that you put some files to Amazon S3, you put some files to Amazon S3 and these particular files you put inside Amazon S3, okay, and these particular files you put inside Amazon S3, we can basically store them in a different level of storage in Amazon S3. I'll, I'll discuss that, don't worry. And once you utilize the different level in Amazon S3, it can reduce the cost also. I'll give you a practical use case for it. So before that, a few things let me I want to tell you. Please wait. So let me open a bucket here. So I click on open particular bucket. So, I, when I go to properties, you can see that I can create, I can basically, I can put something called as object level logging. When I put object level logging, I can basically see what all, who all are putting the files inside, who all are taking the file. I can see all the activities inside this particular thing. But if you want to modify a file inside this, what you have to do is you have to select the file, actions, download. First of all, you have to download this file, modify the file and upload it again. Okay. You cannot modify the file from here itself. If you want to modify the file, you have to do it uh, by default, like download the file, modify it. Okay, that's it. Hope it's clear for you. Yes, object level logging is possible. Yes, you can go to properties here. You can you can do basically object level logging here. See this? Basically, you can see what all things are done in the system bucket, like who uploaded, who downloaded, everything. We can do a lot more. Like for example, and uh, S3 also supports something called as multi-part upload team. Like for example, I have seen this issue. Like some, let's say for example, as somebody asked me here, okay, Prince asked me here, let's say if I have a file which is having one TB size. Let's say in this one TB size file, when I'm uploading a one TB file, single file to Amazon S3, 
let's say once it reaches 70 percentage okay once it reaches 70 percentage the connection broke the internal connection broke and there was some problem at that time you don't have to worry about it you can upload the rest you don't have to upload the file from the scratch completely so it will support multi-part upload and resuming like it is like a torrent it will support resuming also you don't have to you know uh, completely download upload the file again you can download the file in between also okay that's it this is basic and even they op they offers you a very much interesting thing also team i'll give you a very interesting thing see let's say i want to host a website okay i want to host a website if you want to host a website you have to basically set up a web server you have to install the os you have to configure the ip address you have to configure a lot of things by the end it can be a headache if it is a static if you are planning to host a static website static website that means there is no forms and all just the normal normal contents if you want to basically host a static website you can host the website inside amazon s3 bucket the amazon s3 will act automatically act as your web server when you enable static hosting when you enable website hosting in amazon s3 amazon s3 will act as your amazon s3 will act as your website or web server okay let me show you an example for that I am creating a website here. Let's say Notepad. Let me create a website here. Uh, welcome to Infosec Team. This is our sample website. So let's create a sample website now. I just save this file as a HTML document. Let's make it index.html. Okay. I made a sample document called as index.html. So what happens is I am uploading this file. Okay, let me let me make it like this. Please wait. So see this this particular bucket is going to act as a web server without a web server pre-installed. See, I upload this file called as index.html here. What is it? Yeah. Let me see this. Yeah. Index.html, I click on this file. Upload. Okay, so I have this file up. You can see that I have a website uploaded here. Okay, so I want this file to be hosted in Amazon S3. So how do I do that? I just make this file public first. First of all, make this file public. Okay, now go to the bucket once again. Go to properties. Go to something called as static website hosting. I click on static website hosting. I scroll down. I create, I just put the file name here, index.html. Okay. I copy this URL. Okay. This is provided by AWS. Okay. I click on save. So when I try to open this website, see this. So basically, I this is a web URL. See this like this. Amazon S3 bucket can act as a static website hosting. So this bucket is currently a web server automatically. See this? So it can give you a lot more advantage. Okay. Even I have seen some companies what they do is they have a landing page, right? For every company, when you go to a company page, there is a landing page, right? Like for example, let's say I type, uh, what do you call that? Let's say, give me a name. Uh, uh, let's say, government of India. Okay. So let's say I click on this website. So this part, when you click on this website, for this website, there's a landing page. Okay, so this is the landing page. So inside this landing page, when you click on something, it will go to some other pages, right? Okay, like the same way, like the same way, you can put the landing static pages inside Amazon S3 and all the web contents and other URLs inside some other location, some other EC2 instances or some other location. So when you click on this thing, it will basically redirect you to all these things. Okay, it will be easy for you. Got it? And doubts team, anything in doubts you have in this? Hope this is clear for you. Oh, hi, Chris. Yeah, yeah so this is clear. Yeah, so uh, there is one option here called a server access login. Okay. So I just wanted to understand on that part. Is it like, you know, for every service, yeah, that option will be there and they just configure so that the logs will be pushed to the centralized. So uh, does it work that way? 
uh, server access logging means like for example who is basically accessing that bucket basically will get that that's what we call as server access logging bucket oh, so only for that particular bucket okay yeah that's all yeah okay. but if you like want, my if question you want, was uh -huh. so my question was like uh, there was that option right so uh, uh, whether we have any option like we configure there and that logs will be pushed to the centralized server kind of thing mm. that you, that you don't have to configure here you can configure that okay in this particular thing called as cloud tray we have a service called as cloud tray actually okay this is basically so is similar to normal, normal networking how we install agents and like that Yeah, no, no. We don't have to install any agents. I'll show you that. Please wait. see. I click. I just. Okay. I just want to send all my log files to a particular bucket. It can be in this particular location or any other location. See this. Okay. Yeah. I can push all my log files from a particular location to or particular account to any any S3 buckets. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, please do you have any option? Uh-huh. Hello. Yeah, tell me, tell me, tell me. Uh, please. Yeah. Uh, do you have any option where for initial 30 days you can keep the files in one bucket and after 30 days you can move to another book? Yes. Yes, we have an option. We call it as life cycle. I'll tell you why. So this is basically a use case I want discuss team. Tell me if you are confused, okay? I'm, I'll give you some use cases of this. very important uh, so what I, i have seen that what happens is let's say my company is storing log files from every location my company is storing log files on s3 bucket even if we say log files is some some kind of small small files let's say i have millions of files i have millions of log files so every day they are generating a lot number of log files and everything is sent to amazon s3 so every day the cost is increasing so whenever i am adding new files it is basically getting the cost is basically getting increased right that is where we have an option called as s3 life cycle life cycle means if i want I, see i'll give an example see for i i, I hope you know this compliance but let's say for example if your organization is basically complying the hipaa standard hipaa is basically a standard for the us healthcare and all so let's say if you are complying hipaa standard you have to keep all the log files for the next 6 years example i am saying okay so like this according to different standards you have to keep the log files for a long time we call it as a data retention policy data retention policy so what i'll do is i have to make sure this file will be there for a long time so in that case what we can do is we can configure something called as a life cycle policy that means that whenever i put a particular file I repeat whenever i put a particular file to amazon s3 bucket okay whenever we put a file to amazon s3 bucket what we can do is when we put the contents let's say i have put some files here objects here so once these objects reaches a particular number of days let's say i am assuming 30 days let's say once after i put the object or put the files into amazon s3 bucket and once it reaches 30 days what happens we can automatically make this particular contents move to some other storage like glacier like s3 in frequent access i'll discuss all this don't worry so i can basically make all these files or objects taken from s3 to some other kind of storage and after let's say after 2 years i can automatically remove them so i can basically set a policy like this i copy some whenever i there is a file copied to this particular bucket the particular files can be copied to another storage after a particular number of days and after that once it reaches 1 year or 2 year we can remove it automatically so like this we can set a policy once you set a policy like this you don't have to worry about the compliance part you copy the files they will take care of the rest clear um okay krish yeah krish yeah. 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 how uh, how difficult is the retrieval uh, how uh, difficult or easy is the retrieval yeah yeah that is purely based on type of storage like for example if you are using glacier storage there is a different type of requirement if you are using infrequent access it's a different one don't worry we'll discuss that i'll show you that don't worry yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. I'm not so sure whether uh, you're going to touch base at the security session comes in. So if there is a bucket and if uh, someone is uploading a file, is there okay. a way that we can uh, the file for malware content or something? Uh, 
No, basically no. For example, when I am trying to upload a content, normally in the normal case, it's no. When you're trying to upload a content to Amazon S3 bucket, you cannot scan it for malware. But still we have a tool called as, because in the bucket, what happens is, whatever things you put in, it is not affecting other files. Why? Because the particular object cannot do anything. The, the platform is not there, right? So they cannot do anything. But the so, problem so, here is, yeah. But if you want to make sure, that. yeah, tell me. My question tell is, me. is there a third party integration? Or yes, it's possible. Third- possible but still there is one more thing let's say for example if i am uploading some kind of credentials like for example let's say i am accidentally uploading some kind of username and password to amazon s3 in that case or if it's a public bucket and all i can basically have an alert i can basically have an alert on that the other way if you want to if you want to make sure there's no malware and all that option is not there okay thank okay. you yeah so now what i'll discuss is now we'll discuss about the encryption the fundamentals in Amazon S3. Then we'll discuss about the life cycle like we'll discuss, right? So let's do one thing. Let's have a break now. And after the break, we'll continue all these things. Like we'll discuss about encryption, we'll discuss about life cycle and everything, okay? Cool, okay? So by the time of the break, I request all of you to link uh, to fill the feedback form. If you don't fill, please fill this form. I hope you all of you got this. Okay, that's it. Okay? Perfect. Please fill this feedback form once you got it. Okay, no problem. So I'm, I share the chat box. So we'll start by what time we can start back? No, no. It's it's here only. See, I always share this here. See, the same thing. If no, if if you're not filled, please make sure you fill the form. If you want to get the recording of the sessions and if you want to get certificate, it's mandatory for you fill the feedback form. Okay, perfect. And uh, team, we can do one thing. We can start back by. We can have fifteen minutes break. We can start back by perfect. Uh, what time? Let's say 10:15. Now oh, it's 10 only. Yeah, yeah. F- of course, we can start by 10:15 IST. Perfect. Okay. Yes, push. Um, perfect. Okay. Let's start back now. So we'll continue over the Amazon S3 a bit more, and then we'll discuss about the VPC, virtual private cloud and the very fundamentals of security and then I'll tell you how to prepare for some certifications in AWS and let's say other cloud platforms and team if you're looking for some kind of you know uh, for personally if you want to have some queries like for example what is the best option for you I, I, I suggest you can just ping me personally we can have a first of all just ping me on whatsapp first then we can have a call so that I can just give you the recommendations based on your personal profile but if I give it, uh, generally it will not work. Okay, because why? Because it can be different for different people. That's why. Okay, that's it. So just just give me a second, team. Just give me a second. So team, this is a feedback form. I'll just share once again. Those who didn't get, get that. Yeah, perfect, Sabri. No problem. That's enough. Okay, that's it. So let's start with the S3 option. So in Amazon, so in Amazon S3, you can see that. See, I'm just opening this Amazon S3 here. Please wait. So if you want to remove a bucket, first of all, if you want to remove a bucket, what I would do, let's say for example, if I want to remove this bucket, okay? If I want to remove this bucket, see, what I have to do is, first of all, I have to make sure I empty the bucket. Okay, I empty the bucket content. So how do I do that? I click on the bucket name. Click on empty here. See this? I have option called as empty. I click on this bucket empty. Okay. I click on empty here. So I put the bucket name. Okay. And I click on empty. So what happens? So this bucket is basically empty now. Okay. This bucket is basically empty now. Now you can easily remove this bucket. See this? I type the bucket name here to remove info sec train 13. I click on delete bucket. See this? I am easily able to empty the contents, right? Okay, that's it. So like this, so like this, what happens is uh, if I want to enable data retention policy, I repeat if I want to enable data retention policy, I have an option called as lifecycle policy in Amazon. So let me give you a brief idea about the data reduction policy. So 
data retention policy so the, the whole idea about this particular policy called as data retention policy is the first thing for compliance so i'll give an example let's say for example according to your company policies or according to your compliance perspectives you are following your company have to keep the log files for the next let's say uh, you have to your company has to keep the log files for the next let's say 3 years example okay so if a, if you store if you want to store all the log files for 3 years or let's say 5 years whatever it is if you want to store the log files for a long time what happens is if you store everything in amazon s3 normal storage it be it will be basically a trouble for you like for example you have to spend a lot of money on that that is where we have to effectively plan the storage where we have to effectively plan the storage so how do i do that for that i can use multiple storage options provided by amazon s3 okay the first one is s3 standard so the thing which we you just saw now okay the thing just you, you just saw now see this this is something you call as s3 standard you open the amazon s3 you can store the files inside it this is what you call as amazon s3 standard okay this is what you call as amazon s3 standard okay so the next one is so the next one is uh after s3 standard okay s3 standard you know right you just upload the contents you just pay for that uh, storage you're utilizing it's over like i'll give an example here see let me open aws calculator aws calculator okay i'm just clicking this this is basically depreciated i'm just showing you that demo please wait you open this so i go to amazon s3 in north virginia if i want to store 1 tb of data if i want to store 1 tb north virginia i have to spend approximately 23.44 dollars see this right that's it that is why so if i store a lot of files on it by the end every month i have to pay more and more money so to avoid that we can basically use an option called as amazon s3 storage tiers okay amazon s3 storage tiers okay so how do i do that i have more than one storage option in amazon s3 s3 infrequent access then we have s3 glacier we have more i'm just giving a demo on this okay so like this we have multiple options that means that this particular storage called as infrequent access is less costlier than s3 standard first point so s3 infrequent access is basically less costly than s3 standard first point like for example let's say if you are storing in this amazon s3 standard for almost 23.44 dollars the same thing when you are storing infrequent access it can be some 18 dollars or let's say 70 dollars it can give you some discount right also but there is one more thing there is a retrieval fee that means that whenever you want to download a file or whenever you want to upload a file you have to pay a very small amount also so the as a word says if you don't want to use the file for a long time like for example i want to store some files in amazon s3 but i don't want to use the file for a long time let's say i don't want to use the file for the next one year or two year then i can basically put that file in amazon s3 in frequent access so you can get the file whenever you want you click on the file you can download but whenever you try to up, download a file or when you want, want to get a file from s3 in frequent access we have a very small retrieval fee okay don't forget that okay that's it but still it can be cost effective those files which you don't want to access every day those files do which you don't want to basically uh, modify or download every day you can basically utilize this s3 infrequent access and this is basically i recommend for database and all database and all database backups and all i can recommend okay example but at the same time the next one is called as s3 glacier 
So when I say S3 Glacier, it's purely an archival storage. So as I told, this was a basically a different service previously, but now it is a part of the same S3 itself. So Glacier is an archival storage. That means that whenever you put some file to Amazon S3 and whenever you're sending it to Glacier, you are sending it to a long-term storage. And what is the problem there? The problem is, the, advan the advantages, advantages very much cheaper. Like it can give you a very, very, like 70, 80% discount. The cost is very less when you put the files in S3 Glacier. But the drawback is, the drawback is, the, you have a retrieval time. Okay, you have a retrieval time also. That means that you put the files in Amazon S3 Glacier, it can be very cheap and all, but if you want to get the file back, you have to put a retrieval request and you have to wait for some time if you want to get that file back. Is it clear? That's what we call as S3 Glacier. So nothing more, it's very simple. You put the file and whenever you want to get the file back, you have to wait for some time. Okay. Uh, yes, device. it's based on the file size. It's based on the file size. Okay, so that's it. So when you put some files to Amazon Glacier, what happens is it will be very much cheaper, very much cheaper. Like let's say it can give up to some 80, 90% cheaper. Okay, approximate let's say 80% cheaper also. But what happened? Yeah, cheaper. But what happens is it will give you or this will give you a retrieval time. That means that whenever you want to get the file back, you have to wait for some time. So that is why this is what I do. I, I'll give you a scenario which I, I have basically we do in the industry. Please wait. Let me show you a scenario here which I uh, we do in the industry here. Please wait. AWS, please wait team, please wait. Let me open that. I'll show you a picture of that. That, that is better. Pictures can talk more clarity. Uh, uh, yeah, got it. See this picture. This is an example picture I want to show you. See this, go through this and see if you have doubts on this. So Amazon S3 bucket, when you when you put some files to Amazon S3 bucket, you can configure a lifecycle policy. That lifecycle policy doesn't mean it's just a rule, okay? So what happens is if that particular files are not basically accessed for the next 30 days it will be copied to glacier or in frequent access whatever it is and after that you can configure a thing to basically rem get removed after one year or two year whatever it is like this you can configure the policy center very well okay that's it so do we need to define uh, where you'd like to move uh, means on the same location or any other uh, reason can we do that or it will be in the same location yeah, but you can see it in the same location like for example you open the console here you open the console here see this you can see it in the same location only thing is you will see this as a different option I'll show you that please wait uh, where, is it? where is it open this bucket please wait team let me show you option here. Please wait. I'll show you that. Yeah, here. So I open this particular bucket here. Okay, I put open this particular bucket here. Okay, inside this particular bucket, when I click on that, you can see that now the storage which is used is basically called as standard. See this? It's showing standard, normal S3. So when you go store to Glacier or when you store to some other kind of things, they will store it as infrequent access or they will store it as Glacier, etc. That's all. The only thing is, if you want to get this file back, or if you want to view this file, in the Glacier thing, you have to put a retrieval request. Okay? Also, and we have a retrieval time. You have to wait for some time. But at the same time, when you go for infrequent access, you don't have a waiting time. You don't have to wait. Okay? What we can do is, we can basically, you know, uh, we can get the data, but you have to pay some money. Okay? That's it. Uh, uh, Rishi, I'll share you the basic PPT now, okay? No problem. The basic PPT I'll share if you want personally. You can ping me personally, I can share, okay? No problem. Okay, that's it. And the retrieval, Krish, do we have to uh, go through customer support or is it 
something with self service nothing nothing it's a complete self service that is the best advantage for amazon like any platforms everything is self service if you can't pay okay let's say tomorrow if you want to get the file back click on the file click on retrieve that's all you'll get the file let's say it can be based on the type of uh, plans you purchased and all some it can be from 5 minutes to let's say 12 hours okay a uh, retrieval is basically prints is basically based on the type of uh, file you are storing the size of the file or let's say what kind of place you are using like that but it can be up from 5 minutes minimum to 12 hours let's say more than that also clear friends clear only perfect yes thanks perfect so that's about amazon s3 team hope you understood this so we are done with the s3 part uh we can ask your doubts so if you have doubts in the storage please ask and one more time i am to tell your team whenever you do something make sure you remove the things otherwise it can basically give you a lot of charge you have a lot of services in amazon s3 like for example sorry amazon storage we have s3 we have efs understand that which is best for which option so i'll i'll give you a practical use case which i felt like for example some customers may ask me sometimes that they want to serve some files i don't want to modify the file continuously i can basically serve the files i want to basically serve the files to the customers worldwide in that case amazon s3 is the best option why because you don't have to worry about the bandwidth you don't have to worry about the storage like storage cost expanding requirements and all it will keep on increasing whenever you have a requirement that's all that is why people prefer amazon s3 okay that's it and now uh no cdn service is something different team so i just i'll just want to if you want i can just tell you overview of cdn service in aws just an overview we'll discuss and team hope you are not boring tell me if you are bored okay so th there is a there is a concept called as cdn i'll discuss this it's very interesting content delivery network and i would say that if you are running a website okay if you are running a business worldwide or if you are running a website or if you are running a page also i suggest you use such some kind of cdn service why because this particular service can give you a lot of benefits i'll give an example here so let's say i have a website okay this is my web server okay inside this web server okay i have website hosted okay let's say for example my website name is awsgladiators.com okay so assume that this particular website is hosted in india so i have website it can be aws or anywhere azure local cloud server whatever it is so i have website hosted in india called as awsgladiators.com so what happens is whenever a person is requesting this website from india they will get it very fast why because okay it's near to him so when i am requesting requesting a website from india it will be very fast right but at the same time when some people outside this country called as india try to like say for like somebody from us somebody from uk somebody from different different locations around the globe is trying to access the website by then you will end up in having a lot of issues the first issue is the page may drop like page drop page drop means like for example you try to open a page okay after some time if the website, the server is not responding or if it is too uh, like too far away basically the page request will show error the second is it will be too slower the third one is all the requests from worldwide is coming to the web server so web server load is increased so basically we have these three issues okay I, i'll give you practical example see for a company for a company their website is there visiting card actually so what happens is all the customers basically visit the website and basically they make sure that this particular or the the quality of the company is primarily assessed by the website right they go to the website see the contents and from that they start the business so running a web content or running something like this can be very critical for a company so in this scenario if you are basically configuring it in a particular region only it's fine but if you want your business okay web server issues like for example it can basically increase the load of web server so what happens is 
whenever you are trying to host a server or whenever you are trying to host a website if you want your customers if you want customers from worldwide to access it okay if you want to customers from worldwide to access it you have to make sure it is basically having a proper cdn you have to make sure you have a proper cdn why because if you don't have a proper cdn service the website will not be properly delivered to the customers it can it can basically show error for the customers it can basically make the website very much slow or dead slow and it can basically increase the load to your web server like this it can cause a lot of trouble right so that is where that is where we use a concept called as cdn the best concept which you can study for the website and all. the first so we have a lot of companies which is providing cdn so the, the one company which i uh, which you heard is basically called as cloudfair i think you heard this right last time there was an attack also that was happened for cloudfair it's a different company called as cloudfair this company suffered an attack last time right i hope you know that but some year some i think some 6 months back they had attack for this cloudfair so almost all the top providers are using cloudfair only then we have something called as cloudfront by aws so aws is providing a service called as cloudfront This is by AWS, and then we have a, a service called as Akamai. So, like this, we have a lot of providers who is providing the CDN services. You can use any of them, no problem. There is no platform biasing. Even you go for Azure, also you have Azure CDN. Like this, so we have a lot of CDN providers. So, what happens is, I'll tell you what happens. So, what happens is, I have a web server. This is my web server. Okay, I have a web server. Web server. Which is holding a website called as let's say AWS Gladiators. dot com. So in this in this particular server is hosted in India. I when I configure CDN, okay, when I configure the concept called a CDN, the content of the website is basically cached to multiple locations worldwide. The content of the website is basically cached to multiple locations worldwide. See this. The content of the site is cached. To multiple locations worldwide, we call this as edge locations. So these are AWS data centers or third-party whatever it is. So, so we have something called as edge locations where we copy the content of the website to the locations around the globe. So tomorrow, if somebody is trying to access it, like say for example, now I am let's say from I am from US. If I am from US, if I am trying to access the website, instead of going to this particular server directly. i can directly go to the edge location i can serve the website i can get the website from this edge location see this let's say if i am from a different country let's say uk i can get the website from here like this i can basically get the website from different different locations from different different edge locations so i don't have any page load so no page drops okay no page drops no high performance high availability high performance the load to web server is reduced we have a lot more use cases okay so like this we have a lot of things then we use the concept called as cdn so team any doubts on the cdn service anything no yeah, it's somewhat similar yes exactly exactly somewhat similar exactly one query yeah tell me mm, so when we uh, configure a cdn service Okay. Will, it auto, will it automatically mm, replicate to throughout uh, AWS cloud, or it will wait for uh, initial request from one of the users? Suppose the user is requesting from US, and then it will keep that um, in its local cache. Uh, can I just repeat one thing? So you have a file in the, uh, in the cache. cache? So yeah. Suppose so. Suppose the server is uh, hosted in India. Okay. and we enable this cdn service for that okay will it will it automatically replicate this uh, uh, through cdn service to throughout the cloud or it will wait for first user to access that service and then it will yes. get in yes exactly when the first user request for service they will they will basically uh, uh, cache the contents and from the next user onwards or next request onwards okay. it will be serving from the cache only okay, okay. and we can set the ticket value also we can set the time to leave value also like for example how long it can it have to be in the cache and all we can set it no okay that's fine thank you yeah okay 
Hope it's clear for you. Any other doubts, team? Okay. Is there any? No, uh -huh. no, no. There's no limitation clause. So what happens is when you put some uh, puts uh, when you cache the contents to us, AWS is having a lot of more than 70 edge locations. Okay, what happens is it can be cached to any other any edge location you want. But there is you can't specify. Okay, this one, this one you can't specify. You can specify in a way like either US or UK or whole like that whole whole world like that. That's why. You can have n number of edge locations, no problem. Uh, yes, one, one, more, one more query on this. Yeah. Uh, suppose this um, web server, where, where this web server is hosted and that reason is isolated. Let's suppose oh. that reason is isolated. Okay. And, uh, okay. and that, uh, that service is already cached by some remote and uh, data centers. So okay. will those data centers can serve uh, when that particular local um, DC is isolated or the reason is isolated? So you're asking yes, when the when this particular thing changes, when this particular or web server changes, will mm -hmm. that be reflected in the edge locations, right? No. Suppose local DC is impacted or the reason is impacted. Okay. Okay. But uh, other locations, other edge um, locations um, are using those CDN services. Okay. Uh, if that local DC is isolated, can that... Uh, can those edge uh, DCs can serve uh, other users because they already yeah, are getting yeah. local cache? No, why? Because until the TTL value is over, for every cache we have a TTL value set, like time to live okay. value. So yeah. until this time to live value is over, until this cache is removed, they will serve the customer. But once okay. the TTL value is over, they cannot get the customer. Okay, that's okay. It. Okay, thanks. Hope it's clear for you. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, yeah, Krish, uh, Agnish here. So one thing okay. is, uh, is it possible to set any kind of policies for the agent? Uh, it's, uh, uh, Anish, can you repeat one second? I am not able to hear, sorry. Uh, I'm asking that, is it possible to set any kind of policy? Yes, of course, yes. Okay. We can set policies like, for example, we can basically integrate firewalls, we can basically set the policies for which all regions can access like that also. But still, in AWS, it's limited. We can have it, but it's limited. Like, for example, we can specify only a specific regions and all. We can do it in Cloudflare and all. And I'll give you one more example. Let's say, for example, uh, yeah, okay. Does Anish, you say something? No, no. Okay. So what happens is, so what happens is, Let's say, for example, yeah, of course, yes, Prince. What happens is, let's say I have a web server here. So I have cached into edge location. So the data cache has, is having a TTL value. So until the TTL value is over, this will be served. So once the TTL value is over, it will be cached again from the edge location, or sorry, from the origin, that web server. Okay. And basically, if you want, you can basically remove the cache also if you want immediately. You can have option for less. Uh, uh, cache invalidation where you can remove it all these things no problem and when you do this DNS and, and the DNS right you don't have to worry about the DNS what happens is you have a CDN URL let's say you have a URL called a cdn.xyz.com example URL is there so when the customer is calling this URL they will basically look for the location they are in like for example let's say I am calling this URL from India I will be served from the website nearby or edge location near to my country when I go to US, it will be serving to near to my country there, or where, the country where I'm in. Likewise, the DNS will automatically switch over. Like you call it as any cast in IPv6. There's a concept called as any cast in IPv6. That means that one to the nearest. So in IPv4, yes, you have a concept. Yeah, okay. in, in, yeah, in IPv4, you have a concept called as unicast, exactly. multicast, yeah, multicast and broadcast. We have something called as broadcast. But in yeah. IPv6, there is no broadcast. Instead of that, we have any cast. That means that one to near. Yes, look, mm -hmm. it is a kind of traffic manager. So any cast means like instead of broadcasting, I'll just talk to the nearby thing. They will basically serve me a request. That's all. Hope it's clear for you. Perfect. So any other doubts, team? Anish, is it clear? Uh, yes. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, anything else team, any doubts in this till now? Can we go to the VPC part? 
like private cloud part. Okay. Now let's go to the private cloud part, which is called as AWS VPC. It's a very simple thing in, I'm explaining, but understand that VPC is com a complete certification we can do. AWS certified networking specialty. We can study a lot of things in that. But here I am just giving you the overview of it. So, stands, VPC stands for Virtual Private Cloud. Let me see if I have a slide for that. Uh, yes, I have a slide. See, basically we have something called as AWS VPC, Amazon Virtual Private Cloud. So what happens is, so when I am putting some EC, when I am just deploying some EC2 instances, the primary concern I have, okay, the primary concern I have for all the VP, all the instances and everything I create in a public cloud provider, let's say AWS, Azure, etc. The primary concern is we have a multi-tenancy. That means we have multiple customers utilizing the same platform. So for that, if you want to make sure you have a separation, for, for that, if you want to make sure you have a proper isolation, what we can do is we can utilize a concept called as AWS VPC. So the advantages, so the advantage of this VPC is it's like you building your own data center. Okay, you can consider VPC like you are building your own data center. The only difference is you are building your data center in a logical way. And you are building your data center in the cloud provider's premises. That's the only difference. So the difference here is VPC means that you are building a logical data center or logical network inside your cloud service provider's, provider's premises getting the benefits of the cloud service provider. Okay, that's it. So let's say for example, I, I go to, a, I'm trying to create an instance. Okay, when I'm trying to create an instance, I'm creating the instance. Uh, Arul, uh, team, I'm audible. Arul, is it clear for you? Um, yes. Okay. I think, uh, yeah, just give me a second. And if anyone is facing any audio issues, please disconnect and reconnect. Okay, no problem. Cool. Okay. So it's like you are building your own data center in the cloud platform, but still building it very easy, but securing it requires a really good skill. See, in you, you can build AWS or you can build Azure, you can build Google, any platform, but securing a cloud platform is a complete different strategy. Why? Because you have to follow a lot of things. You have to consider proper monitoring. You have to consider proper logging. You have to con proper consider proper security practices. A lot of things like that. So let me show you an example here. So now when you create AWS account, okay, when you create AWS account, they will automatically create you something called as a VPC. So understand that VPC is something which is specific to the region. So understand that for every region, you have a VPC. So understand that for every region, we have a dedicated VPC. Let's say, for example, for Mumbai region, we have a VPC. For Singapore region, we have a VPC. It's like that. For every region, we have a dedicated VPC. Let me show you that. So before that, just please wait. See this? You can create a logical network in the AWS Cloud Platform. Okay? And it's completely like, okay? And it's completely like, our data center which you operate in the AWS platform. Okay. Arul, can you hear me now? Arul, can you hear me now? Arul, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. I think no. Hello? Yeah, yes, yes, Jan, tell me. Yeah, by default, every region will have only one VPC. Yes, by default, every region will have only one VPC. We can have more than one VPC, right? Yeah, we can have more VPC also. But as for by default, they will have one only one VPC by default, okay? In the US, why should we have more than one VPC? Yes, why? Because if I want to have a separation of my 
resources in a complete complete secure way, complete isolated way. I can I can use uh, multiple VPCs. Like for example, I have seen that when you go to companies, if you, if you see, I'll give an example here. See this in your company, you have a concept called a zones, right? Like for example, you have a you have a private zone, you have a public zone, you have a DMC. Like this, you have different different zones, right? So like this, for if you want to, for zones also, you can make separate VPCs as well. Like this, when the company size increases. When the number of requirements increases, you can create multiple AWS accounts also. You can connect between multiple VPCs. You can have a secure communication between the VPCs and all. Okay, that's it. Hello, Krish. Yeah, yeah tell, me. tell me about me. Uh, Krish, I have one question. Uh, okay. uh, you know, in our first uh, uh, webinar, we have discussed that we have a region. And uh -huh. in the region, we have availability zone. Yes. And those availability zone uh, actually have different AWS uh, services. So my question okay. is that uh, VPC uh, shared the availability zone. So is there any hard and fast rule uh, to choose those yes. uh, availability zones? Yes, of course. That means that, yeah. See, let's say I told you. Uh, let, let me write, draw it in a diagram here. You will be able to understand clearly. I don't want to simply just say it by words. Please okay. wait. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So uh, assume that this particular thing is your VPC. Let's say, for example, I'll just write down here. Okay, this is your VPC. The region. Okay, spans a region. Okay, don't forget. So I have a VPC here, spans a region. So inside the VPC, you cannot, I told you, you cannot create anything inside the region. You have to create it inside the availability okay. zones, right? You have yes. to create all these things inside the availability zones. So what I'm suggesting is you can click on this. You can create something called as availability zones here. See this? These are your availability zones. But in, in the VPC perspective, we don't call it as availability zones. We call it as something called as subnets. That's all. Don't confuse. It's the availability zone I'm talking about. Okay. In the okay. VPC perspective, I'm talking about subnets. So subnet is basically the availability zone. Okay. That's okay. it. So let's say I have created two subnets. So inside the subnets, I can create resources. So okay, I'll so just show you that. Short, okay, so in yeah. short, the VPC, uh, I mean the subnets are uh, something where we divide the VPC into that availability. Yes. yes, I'll show the best practical example for this. Let's say I am just deploying an instance here. Okay, I am deploying an instance here. It's uh, It will take some, at least you have to spend some two to three days learning this if you want to understand it completely but I'll show you that please wait so I am going to launch see carefully I'm going to launch the instance I click on launch instance in Mumbai okay and when I click on launch instance I select some AMI I select the instance type this is where we want so see this you have to launch this inside a VPC only you cannot launch it without a VPC so you have to create a VPC and inside the VPC so let's say, for example, you choose your VPC. So this is your default VPC here. This is my custom VPC I created for a different batch. So I click on now normal VPC. And inside that, I can specify which subnet. So subnet means what? It is the availability zone. So in Mumbai, they have three data centers, three availability zones. And each of them is a subnet. I can either plan it for the first one or second one or third one. I can plan it by myself. No problem. Or I can so basically tell AWS to choose. Yeah, my question is to this only that while choosing uh, the uh, from the same region for the South One B, South One C. So okay. what what is the possible? I, I mean, good uh, uh, VPC. I mean, how I can uh, make a decision? Yeah, this uh, my this VPC should be into One B. My another VPC should be into One C, uh, and uh, the one will uh, should be in One A. I mean. What are the just, uh, just to understand it, that yes, what is the best one from the other one? I mean, how I can decide to go for one? Yeah, yeah I'll tell you. Uh, no, actually, it is not a source group. It's a different one. You're talking about actual resource group, right? No. So I'll I'll show you an example here. I'll show you an example here. So let's say let's say for example, you can create an instance in either here or either here wherever it is you want to create, you can create an instance. But what I suggest is. 
when you are configuring load balancing when you are configuring replication and all i always suggest you have your primary server in one zone and the secondary server in the second zone so what happens is even if this particular zone completely goes down you can continue the operation from here that's why i told you when you configure something all the subnets and all or when you con when you, when you planning to choose a zone make sure you plan one of your instance in one zone the other in other zone so what happens is even if one zone rarely in worst case if it goes down you can continue the operation from the other zone also is it clear okay now i got it okay yeah and and we have a lot of uh, interesting strategies tell me tell me ஒரு <laughs> Okay. It doesn't require any connector, right? Yeah, you have to configure that. That's all. You have to configure VPC peering. That's all. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Prince, what happens is, okay, you told. Uh, yes, the zones are connected to each other. That means that uh, if you want to have a communication from the server one to server two in the two two zones, let's say I have a server one here and I have another server here. If I want to do a, have a communication, I can basically make it like this. It's automatic. It's by default there. you can connect using local ip address private ip address okay that's it uh yeah please this thing happened because of the uh, vpc same right that is why yeah, of course, yes sir. yes but still okay let's let's say if you have a different vpc if you want if you have a vpc another vpc here if you want to communicate with this it's also possible we call it as vpc peering can be connecting multiple vpc together Okay, but, but that time is also used by the private IP, or it will be a. Uh, uh, can repeat. Uh, when you are connecting to another VPC, uh, okay. will it be connect to that private IP, or it will be part of private? Uh, basically, it it requires a public IP, but still okay. you have options where you can use the private IP also. Okay. We can okay. configure the gateways and all. Yeah. See, that is the security best practices. We can use security best practices where we can make sure. Uh, these things are not communicating the internet okay uh yeah prince no prince so the servers are not replicated across availability zones why because each availability zone can be having multiple data centers right so when you create a server if you want to have a, a different different region or let's say if i want to have a server here if you want to have backup server here you can configure it manually at the same time when you create a server inside a zone it will be there in that particular zone only by default in ec2 So, Krish, in case if we have a server uh, hosted in a specific zone, okay. and we we do have some issues over there, and uh, will my service will be impacted or because, as you stated now, so it yeah. will not be replicated to other zone. Yes, of course. Like for they are offering some ninety nine point nine nine percent availability for every zone. That means that you have only a very few seconds, or let's say very few downtime, uh, when the worst case. but still what happens is if you want to make make double sure you have to man do it manually but when you create a instance in amazon ac2 that is basically in only one zone and one zone means you have multiple data centers right it is it is definitely replicated across the data centers mm -hmm. okay and if you want to make double sure you can basically do a load balancing something like that and you can copy the instance from one re, one zone to another zone also even in my strategy which i have for my customer i have make sure i have a instance in one region i have another the backup instance in another region also that means that even if one complete region goes down i can continue yeah. my operation from the other region also mm -hmm. yeah thanks perfect so just give me a second so that's it don't forget team amazon vpc is a very very important concept you can basically uh, create logically separate networks and you can create multiple vpc in the same region also it's like you create your own data center inside aws that's all and i'll give an example see yes of course mahindra it's possible it's it's very easy to and it's possible so what happens is let's say for example if i have a instance okay 
if I have an instance in one region, let's say when I have an instance, as you have seen that, we will get a public IP address, we will get the DNS information, we will get all the networking things pre-configured in the actual default VPC. But when you are configuring your VPC, you have to configure all of this separately. Okay, that's it. That's a primary advantage and primary problem also. Let me show you that. Please wait. So, I'll show you the VPC part. I'll go to VPC here. Let me just uh, go to another region. I don't want to take chance. I have my some critical servers running here. So, I go to VPC here. Very simple. I go to VPC here. Please wait. So if you want to make a cluster service with uh, different nodes in each uh, subnet of uh, same region and uh, different regions, is the network okay. configuration become clumsy? I mean, when we do it's very different simple. nodes, no, then the load balance to go, uh, I mean... Uh, they will take care of it. Service. They will take care of it. You know okay. how to worry about it. Like for example, whenever you want, you can do it very easily. Within a few clicks, you can do that. AWS will take care of it. What happened to my AWS account? And suddenly it went off. Just give me a second team. I don't know what happens. Yes, Vijay, it's basically a, a very complex concept. It's okay. We can, we, we can do one thing. Let me show you that now. I'll, I'll show you that now. If you have more doubts, we can discuss it offline. No problem, okay? Just ping me. Okay? I'll support you. No problem. Because VPC is not a single day, one hour topic, it, it, it takes a lot of time to learn, like from the scratch, you need to learn the IP addressing, submitting, you must know what is routing, you must know what is gateway, firewalls, you must know how it is, basically what is the building blocks, everything you must know, it, it will take some time definitely. So I am giving you an overview only now. Please wait. Uh, this I, uh, IP subnetting, VLAN, or this, all these uh, based on that uh, uh, availability zone, uh, it will come into picture, all these things? Uh, so for the, for the complete VPC, why? Because for subnets, you must, so for, uh, for availability zones, you have to learn subnetting fundamentals. For routing and all, you can learn uh, the VLANs and all. The conceptualized knowledge is very good, that's all. So just give me a second. And don't worry can... if you need it. Yeah, tell me. Uh, I mean, is there any AWS service where we can actually communicate the uh, virtual device uh, for networking point of view, I'm saying? Uh, okay. Like we have the virtual switch uh, okay. in some of the cases. Even AWS has, uh, as I'm doing the Meraki certification, we also uh -huh. have some of the virtual Meraki devices on the cloud. Yes, yes. So is there, yes. is there, is there any such AWS uh, service or I would yes. say a virtual gateway where we can yes. actually communicate between my hardware which is based on to my premises and okay. uh, the okay. one which we have created uh, let's say for an example we have created one uh, virtual switch into the AWS so is there any way where we can communicate it in, be in between that yes of course yes we can we can do that no it's very easy we can do that no problem okay yeah, that, that we can do one thing. You can just ping me personally. I can support, I can just tell you the strategy, okay? Okay, okay. Because why no because I discuss it here. It, it is basically, it can take a long, lot of time. That's why. Yeah, I know, I know that. Those are the some yeah. in the top. Meraki learning is very good. Very, because why? Because uh, Cisco Meraki is a lot of things we can get. We can learn. It's very good, interesting. Yeah, actually, they are having some of the services into the AWS and I'm very interested yeah. to go for it. Yes, yes. Just give me a second team. I had some issues with the, my bandwidth coming that way. Please wait. Having a lot of traffic, which is causing the buffer. Please wait. Let it open. It is taking some time. Yeah, last time I was doing some other configurations also. That's why it's taking some time. Please wait. It must be approved from a different location as well. That's why. 
So see, by the time it's opening, I'll just show you an example here. See, understand that BPC is something, okay, BPC is something which will help you to create a logically isolated, logically separate network inside your AWS. Like if you want to make sure, okay, if you want to make sure you have a complete security, if you want to make sure you have a complete isolation between your uh, other customers and you, or let's say you and your uh, on-premises security and all, you can have BPC. See this? You can see that by default, there is one VPC in the region here, North Virginia. So I told you, VPC is something which is spanning your region. See this? We have a VPC. So inside this VPC, you can see that we have a subnet. Subnet means don't confuse. Why it is showing some six subnets here? Because we have six availability zones. See? We have six subnets. So don't confuse. Each of them is a basically one availability zone. That's all. So for them to come for these availability zones to communicate with each other, they have something called as routing tables. So routing table means they can communicate in between the subnets using yeah, in Azure we call it as VNets. Yes, Lolit. In Azure we call VPC as VNets. Okay. So that's it. So basically uh, the we can basically, you know, create a routing table for this. So inside the routing table, we have a route between multiple subnets. See this? We have a route between multiple subnets. And we have a concept called as internet gateway. That means that if you want your subnet, I repeat, if you want an instance in the subnet to communicate to internet. Let's say, for example, I have an instance in, in a, my VPC in a subnet. So if I want the instance to communicate to outside or inside, incoming and outgoing traffic, I have to configure a gateway. So gateway is like your modem, right? When you when you have a modem in your home, what happens? You have to make sure all the, uh, if you want to get the internet, your traffic must go through the modem. Like the same way, you have a gateway in AWS. So if the if an instance in the subnet want to access from outside, or let's say if I want to access an instance from outside, I have to make sure it is basically connected through the internet gateway. Is it clear? That's it. Then. We can configure IP addresses. We can configure security groups also. So what is security group and firewall at team? Don't forget. So these two things I want to explain very much. NACL and network ACLs and security groups. NACLs and security groups. The difference is, let's say we have a VPC here. Or let me just make it to the paint actually. See, we can basically specify, as, as we have discussed, if you have an instance here, okay, this is your ECB instance, okay? This is your ECB instance here. Okay, EC2. So this particular instance is secured using a technique called as security groups. You know that, right? The file told you, right? The firewall configuration we use for securing the instance is called as security groups. That means that for every instance you create, you have a firewall configuration which binding it called as security groups. For every instance you're creating, you have a security configuration which is binding it called as security groups. So the security group will give you a very clear idea or security groups will give you a very clear idea of basically who to allow or who to block. This is basically in the instance level. Like the same way, you can decide who can enter your subnet also. Like for example, if I want to make sure only those people allowed will be entering my subnet. So for that, what I can do is here I can have a barrier called as ACLs, access control list. We call this NACLs, network ACLs. So what happens is you can basically set the ACLs and we can set the subnets. We have multi-layer security. So when, when somebody try to enter the VPC to a, sub, to a instance, first of all, it has to pass through the ACL. Then it has to pass through the security groups. They can have more file controls here. That's all. Is it clear team? Is it clear team? Uh, so those ACLs, uh, yeah, Agnish here. Uh -huh. So those okay. ACLs will provide the rights only to filter the person who will enter the subnet. Yes, yes. They can decide either it can be from inside only. Let's. I, I can give an example. Let's say I can I can tell them that only the employees who is accessing from my organization on premises. Let's say for example, this is my organization, this is my company. So only those people, if they are accessing from my company, they will be able to open this. If they're trying to open this from the outside world, they will not be able to open. Likewise, they can set a lot of rules here. Okay? They can have multiple layers. And team, there is one more team, I, one more thing I want to tell you. Uh, 
whenever you're talking about security in any perspective in talking security a single layer of security is always compromise it can easily be compromised that is why you use a concept called as defense in depth so what is defense in depth defense in yeah of course yes defense in depth means what happens is okay defense in depth means what happens is you are using multi layer production you are using a acl you are using a firewall you are using web application firewall you are using a some likewise you are using different different layers of protection combined together to give you the optimum result so single layer of protection can easily be compromised so it's always best practice to have a multi layer protection okay that's it so let's do one thing let's create a sample vpc vpc without this doing it is not no use right so let me create you a private cloud on this i click on create vpc so i i don't want you to create it like this you get confused you can go to the vpc dashboard first if i want to show you customize everything it will take at least 5 hours so let's click on vpc dashboard here i click on launch vpc wizard okay so they will ask me that either i want to create a vpc i click on this vpc here i click on select i can put the vpc name my custom vpc i can put the vpc name i can put the subnet name also see this my subnet so i can create a vpc which spans a region inside the vpc i can create a subnet i can click on create vpc see what happens they will create everything for you but when you when you learn more when you try to learn more you will get more concepts at that time what happens is at that time you have to learn a lot more like you have to learn the concepts everything you have to do everything by customized see now you can see that we have vpc here see this so let's do one thing let's go to amazon ec2 here please wait Wait. Let's open. Uh, I am going to create an instance inside my VPC. Okay. Uh, I believe what happens is ACL, ACL and security is provided by AWS by default. But definitely you can customize it. You can customize the rules and all. It is already there by default. So you see this. I show you that. When I go to AC, this ACL, I click on this. You can see that I have ACL here. See this. but this rules i can con i can configure who what to allow what to block i can basically configure the rules here okay that's it so let me run, let me create a instance here i click on launch instance okay inside this launch instance i can select any ami i want let's say i'm selecting any ami i am selecting the VPC here. See this. I can select it in my VPC. See this. I click on my custom VPC. I can select my subnet. Likewise, I can utilize this to launch an instance. Is it clear? So this is what we call as the VPC part. Okay, that's it. So team, don't worry. If you if you if you are trying to learn this, I can provide you the resources also. If you need any support, just ping me. I can support you there. Okay, that's it. So that's about the AWS topics we're discussing. So now, what I'm planning for you and team, any, any queries? Yeah, any more queries you have? Anything, team? Tell me on this VPC and all. So, Krish, uh, one yeah. question: uh, Can you yeah. repeat the ACL? So that's the first one. Second one, in terms of VPC, though it says a virtual private client or cloud. Okay. Sorry. Um, okay. Even the when you have the instance on the public cloud, even then okay. you have the VPC. Okay, like you're asking about when you have when you have a private cloud. Let's say when you have a public cloud platform like AWS, is it better to have a VPC, right? right? Yeah, that means it that it does have a VPC. Yeah, of course, yes. See, in AWS also, in Azure also, in AWS we call it as VPC, in Azure we call it as VNets. That's the only difference. The thing is, whenever you are creating instance and all, whenever you are creating a resource inside this AWS, you are creating it inside a VPC, which will make it isolated from the other customers. but understand that 
they are providing a logical isolation so when you go to on premises you have a physical isolation you have a dedicated thing right but here you have a logical isolation that's all okay yeah and prince what happens is by default we have a default vpc memory account if you want to have multiple vpcs or let's say if i want to customize each and every option like this subnets routing tables if i want to customize all this i can create a custom vpc but it's very easy so is the it's software like, defined network means these the same concept uh no sdn is basically a concept what happens is you have let's say for example you have routers you have switches you have like this you have multiple network devices so we can basically we can have a control layer we can control all these things together okay so sdn can basically help you monitor and control all these things effectively but sdn is working in the background in vpc also that's all okay okay so vpc concepts might be implemented using sdn okay yes in the background they are using sdn only so let me remove the vpc which i created as i told you if you don't need anything make sure to remove it and don't remove the default vpc okay done okay so don't worry team vpc is not it's not a bit, bit complex thing only thing is we have to go from the very scratch we have to go to a lot of things read a lot of things but it's very easy for me for you also it's very simple i'm sure okay uh yes so I'll, i'll give you the fundamentals docker so team you know this port called as docker right just give an example of that docker so what happens is we you know this concept called as docker right team docker means we call it as the containerization that means that uh, yes i don't will explain that no problem so what happens is when you say docker so instead of running a complete virtual machine you can run the exact precise library files or binary files required for an application like for example let's say i want to run a website or let's say web application i want to run apache i want to run some kind of particular applications in that case instead of installing the complete operating system instead of taking all the resources i can basically take the exact library or binary files required and host this application so instead of creating a complete virtual machine i can create a concept called as containers so containers means it's a basically a very smaller very simple unit which is not at all a complete web server or complete instance i'll give an example here let's say i'm just giving you an overview team it can we can take it can take a lot of lot, lot of time to explain this so let's say i have a hardware here i'm discussing about containers okay so inside the hardware what happens is i can install a operating system let's say i am installing windows or linux i prefer linux in this so on top of this basically you can install something called as a containerization platform let's say docker or any platform what happens is instead of going through this complete operating system instead of building a complete virtual machine i can basically use this particular platform and provide the necessary binary files or library files and host an application so this application is basically running called as container clear on it we have a lot more things to do we can do that but still that is basically uh, if you want we can have a talk or we, I, i'll just give you a call on that no problem fine this is the basic concepts and if you want to run docker on cloud platform what we can do is we can use a concept called as ecs e elastic or ec2 container service okay we can run docker we can run kubernetes all these things on aws also okay that's it clear with uh chris can can we put uh, kubernetes cluster on aws 100% yes see this we have application called as elastic kubernetes service when i scroll down you can see that we have a concept called as kubernetes i'll just show you that please wait yeah see this elastic kubernetes service see here okay so yeah. if if we and want to if we, if we just want to learn um, kubernetes cluster and all that okay do we need to use uh, ec2 or we can use uh, no 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 a light if you No, no. I why suggest this? If you want to learn Kubernetes or if you want to learn Docker, I suggest you learn it from your laptop. And once you learn from laptop, if you want, once you want to deploy it on the production scenarios and all, you can go for AWS or Azure, like in EKS 
ECS, etc. Okay. 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 I, I have Otherwise, the cost is a bit higher. Uh, okay, I have one more question related to okay. AMI. Okay. So, so this AMIs, let's say if you import them, uh, okay, you know, in F3 and you know you you run the instance in EC2. Um, okay, then if you want to access the URL from from internet, how okay. how can you do that? Like you host a website in Amazon, is it right? That's what I'm talking about. Right? So, so let's say a a, a, a portal is in uh, the the image, okay, the AWS image, and okay. there is a web browser. So if I want to access it outside, uh, you know, from internet, not inside okay. the VM, how can I do that? You can basically use a public API. You will get the public API address here, right? Like for example, you will get the public API address. You will get the credentials and everything, right? You can access it, no problem. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's very simple. You can get the IP address from itself. See, I'll show you that. Yes, I don't know. I'll explain that. Please wait. I'll explain that. Okay. So I go to EC2. Please wait. You are discussing security also. Please wait. Yeah, I know. We were discussing VPC and I was, I'm asking you something off topic, you know. Yeah, yeah okay, okay. Because when I saw that you were having ACL and all that in VPC, so it just okay. stuck. Yeah, yeah, I had that issue. Yeah, no problem. We can basically, you know, rush, uh, allow the rules and all. Like for a, by default, ACL is so flexible. But uh, what happens is, yeah, I'll just please wait. I'll show you that. Let open. I don't know what is happening in the buffer. My browser no, is basically. No, even I try to access. It's very slow. No, no, it's why because currently the situation is like. Uh, a lot of service and everything is running on AWS. The workload is very high. That's why a buffer is there. But that doesn't yeah. affect the service, okay? Only the console is affected. The service is not affected. My, my. See, this this particular server can be accessed from anywhere in the world using this IP address. But now I don't have config or anything. I have only restriction here. But still, if you have if you have this IP address or if you have a DNS name, you can basically call it from anywhere in the world. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. And Rohit, you're asking about security, right? So security is very simple, Rohit. We can basically configure security while we create Docker containers, while we expose the containers to the public, while we set the firewall inside the container. Likewise, we can have multiple layers of security for the container. Like for example, let's say for every container also. For sorry, what happened? So for every container also. Okay. For every container also, please wait. We can create uh, multiple layers of security, like uh, we can create firewalls, we can create access list, we can create boundaries. Likewise, we can ha have multiple layers of security for all the Docker containers. And if you configure properly, that containers will be completely secure. You, you must you must decide which must be exposed to public, which must not be exposed like that. Okay, that's it. And uh, yeah, Arun was asking about ACLs, right? So what happens is, I'll repeat ACLs once again. Yeah, no, no problem. We can just ping me. I can just support you on this Docker thing. I can show. I can fix your doubts. No problem. So what happens is, let's say we have a VPC here. Okay, we have a VPC here. So inside the VPC, we can basically create subnets. I told you, right? So when you want to enter a subnet, there is one guy who is start, standing there, which is called as the network ACLs. So you can basically use network ACLs to control who is basically or who can basically enter the subnet or who cannot enter. And like for example, I can set the rules. Like for example, only allow this particular IP address, only this allow this particular port number. Likewise, I can filter my rules in the network ACLs. So ACL is the primary level of defense. After ACL, the, the, the next level of defense is security groups. Clear on? Is it clear? Uh, yes, Krishna. So, okay. security group is um, aligned with um, instance, just the instance. Okay. And an ACL is collection of all the instance, right? Or maybe the overall uh, instances. Right? Yeah, the whole the whole zone. It is spanning the whole zone. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cow so, sir, no, no, it's not Krish. similar to it. Yeah, different thing. Yeah. Tell me. Uh, uh, Krish Jain here. Yeah, tell me. Hello. Let, tell me, tell me, tell me. Yeah. Do you have any configuration? Suppose 
I am deleting a VPC. I want uh-huh. a configuration where the request should go to my manager for the approval. Unless and until he approves, I should not be able to delete that VPC. Of course, yes. Of course, yes. we can set the rules. We can set the policies for that. No problem. It is there, right? We have, yeah, of course, yes. See, we have control in each and every layer. Like, for example, who can access, who cannot access, what level of access, how, when. We can specify everything. And that is why okay. when I take the AWS Certified Security Specialty, right? When I take the AWS Security Specialty Certification, it's taking some 20, 30 hours more than any other people because I am just basically focusing on all these kind of security things. Because that, that is what you do in the okay. real time, right? So you have to understand that in a very clear way, that's all. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Oh, okay. Cool. Perfect. And so now we'll discuss about the, let's find up these topics. Let's discuss about a few more things like the AWS certification things and all for your understanding. And if you need any more support also, I can just support, no problem. Let me see if I have done something wrong. No, I think. Le- okay. So AWS certifications list. And team, I am showing you the list of certifications generically. If you have any doubts about which certification you have to choose, I can talk to you personally. Why? Because it is different for different people. It's I don't say that, okay, you go for AWS, this one, all for everyone. I say it based on the person only. But I'll give you an overview of that. You can choose by yourself or you can just support me or ping me also. No problem. The only thing is, understand that uh, it's not worth like you go to all the certificates. I have seen, and that's, that's my perspective only, okay? You go to all the certifications, it will not give you much benefit. So plan your career path only based on that, go to do the certifications. Okay? So these are the certifications currently provided by AWS, okay? The first one is, we have a AWS foundation level certification that this is called as a cloud practitioner. Let's say if you are a manager who want to learn the fundamentals of AWS, let's let's say you are a pre-sales guy. Let's say you are a person who want to start with AWS. Just the fundamentals if you want to start, you can go for the AWS certified cloud practitioner. But uh, if you want to go build your com- career in your cloud platform and all, I don't suggest you go for a cloud practitioner. This is just a fundamental, this is a very fundamental certification. That means that if you want to start with cloud, if you want to know what is cloud, if you want to know the service in AWS, if you want to have a starting in AWS, you can go for the AWS certified cloud practitioner. Okay. And if you want to start your career in AWS, you have to start with some kind of associate certifications. And team, one more thing I think I want to tell you, I want to repeat for you. There is no certification prerequisites for AWS. That means that if you want to do the professional certification or if you want to do the associate certification or if you want to do the specialty certification, there's no pre-certification requirements. Like some years back, what happened to me was, some years back, this was there. If you want to do a specialty exam, first of all, you have to go to the associate, then the professional, then the specialty. But now you can directly go to any certification. Okay, that's it. So this is the cloud, the fundamental certification. And basically, I have seen that people start their career by either one of the certification. So we have three certification associate level in AWS, called as AWS Certified Solutions Architect Associate, AWS Certified Sub Administrator Associate, and AWS Certified Developer Associate. So I, I felt like these two are almost similar. The difference is in this, and the topics are almost similar. The difference is in this particular sysops administrator, we are focusing more onto the operations perspective. In the exam, the questions can be more and more biased to the operations perspective. Yes, Rohit, that we can discuss. That we can discuss, Rohit. So, as I, as I told you, anybody who is having any doubts in the platform like things, like where, which, which platform to choose properly, feel free to ping me. WhatsApp me first, then we can have a call, okay? And feel free to ping. We can we can talk. I don't want to just randomly say a certification name, but we have to plan your career. See, how do you plan it? Just before I explain this, it's a very, very important thing, team. Tell me if you're bored, okay? This is what I'm telling you. Based on your experience, based on your skill set, based on a career goal, based on the opportunities, Okay, then 
then what based on the trend so like this or let's say futuristic so like this you have to consider all of these things before you choose a cloud certification or let's say you go to aws or azure or ccsp or whatever it is let's say you go to security cloud or development testing whatever platform is fine so don't say that don't understand that any platform is bad you can go to any platform and all the platforms is giving you benefits but the only difference is you have to make sure what are platforms you are utilizing make it based on this that is why i told you we can plan this purely based on your requirements that they will discuss that and i will give you the best choice okay so sometimes okay if if you if you if you are already having a very best very best strategy if your plan is very good suddenly you see cloud you go into cloud it can be a, sometimes trouble for you or let's say you you are currently interested in cloud but you don't know how to start with it i can support you on that likewise you can ping me no problem right okay that's it so don't forget team the first one is aws uh, cloud practitioner i am suggesting the certification only for those pre sales people who is just want to know what is aws for those management people who want to know what is aws just want to have a awareness of it we can go for this but this is not i don't recommend in my personal perspective because it's first thing is it's nothing it's very simple uh, like billing cost management or those kind of things only but this is something where we can start very much like for example you can go for a certification called as aws certified solutions architect okay when you go for the certification called as aws certified solutions architect associate you will learn almost a lot of like for almost 70% services in the aws console and in this particular thing the questions are more focused on what is the best option for this what is the best option for that how do you design a strategy you have a issue like this how do you solve it how do you define a solution so all the questions are more from a architecting perspective but in this exam it is more from a operations perspective that's the only difference okay but both are similar so let's say when i take the certification i don't have that for this now but when i take the certification what happens is i can i will choose either okay i'll just tell them either they come for this one or this one i take in the same batch why because i don't focus on certifications only that's why i don't take i, I don't want to uh, bias to a certification you can take both of it also if you want okay and this is basically for developers like for example let's say i am a developer i want to start with cloud for my development process and all so i can learn the startup development certification okay and this is one of the best certifications you can get aws certified solutions architect professional that means that all the things you study in this associate level thing you will study in depth or little more in depth in the professional perspective okay and what i suggest is you can go for any either one of the aws associate level certification then you can go for the specialty okay we have currently six specialties in aws now this is newly introduced and all we have six specialties uh, networking specialty security specialty machine learning and all so currently i am taking this particular thing security specialty and this one networking specialty also but this is more in demand because it will give you a more security like those people who want to last start with cloud security those people who want to build a career in cloud security has to do the certification mandatory for less aws certified security specialty okay that's it uh so, chris any doubts on this yeah tell me uh, chris just one question as you you are uh, showing this uh, specialty uh, certification see uh, okay. advanced networking i uh, i am basically from the networking background so uh, in yeah. networking we also do have a security like firewalls we do have uh, there are various vendors although but my question yeah. is that uh, out of advanced networking so the this security part is not covered into advanced networking so networking is plain without security in advanced uh, networking is that so no no we are basically uh, it is almost similar but still what i am in this we are more focusing on this vpc vpn those kind of things okay but here we are focusing on logging we are focusing on monitoring we are focusing on encryption and key management we are focusing on uh, oh, platform security we are focusing on something network security this is why i i advise go to go to this more it can give you more benefit than the network specialty okay but yeah. i guess uh, aw uh, we still uh -huh. should have some kind of basic understanding of the networking to go for the security 
Correct. But that you can get from here. That you can get from this certification. Then you can go okay. for this. That's why I'm offering a combo for this. Why? Because when people ask me about the AWS Certified Security Special, they have seen that. Uh, definitely, mm -hmm. they need some skill set. At least some 60% topics they need to know from this particular certification. So what yes, I, I made a combo course. Yes, I made a combo course where I teach some some topics from this, almost some 60-70% topics from this, and after that I go to the security specialty. I combine that in a single course, so they can buy, they can basically write this exam with so much confidence. And my trainings are not basically focused on exam. That's a first point. Was why because. Exam writing is very simple in AWS. I'll tell you yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I am taking this almost 50 to 60 hours just because I I want to do a scenario. Scenario is what will give you the benefit. You learn more. You let get more hands on. You get more scenarios. You get more strategies. You'll be able to work effectively. Like tomorrow, when a company is asking for a requirement, you must know how to do it, right? That's why I give you more labs on this. Lab is basically I focus on labs only. 70 or 80 percent topics I am focusing on labs only. More labs, more skills. Yeah, the cost I'll explain. Yeah, the cost is. No, that's why that's why Nishant, I just made a combo for this. Like for example, I have a combo here. So we cover the associate level first, then we go to the security specialty. We have a combo. Okay, but we can talk offline, no problem. You can ping me, okay? And one more thing, team. So don't forget. So the associate all for all these certifications for all these associate level foundation level certification. Or let's say for this associate level certifications, the cost is one fifty dollars. Okay, for associate level certification, the cost is one fifty dollars. Okay, for the professional certification, the cost is three hundred dollars. For specialty, the cost is three hundred dollars. Okay, that's it, and it's valid for all the certifications. Are valid for three years. That doesn't mean that you have to pass every exam every three years again and again. I'll tell you no. I'll tell you why not. Okay, that's it. Clear? No, Swanand. Swanand basically CCSP is a different strategy. So uh, let's let's do one thing. Let's plan a different a different session for it. So you can just talk to me personally. I can share the difference between CCSP and AWS. It's a completely different thing. It is it is connected, but still it's a completely different strategy for CCSP and different strategy for AWS. Okay, you can ping me personally. I can support. So it's based on your experience, and you know, I have to explain that way. Yes, yes, those are the expiry. The expiry is basically three years from the date of certification. You have the it will expire within three years. Uh, do AWS security is uh, has covers some of the cyber security part as well? Yes, of course. Like they will cover something like monitoring this encryption things, like privacy, key management. Uh, like identity identity management, access management, authentication, authorization, laws like uh, pen testing, vulnerable testment, everything they will cover. Don't worry, I'll show you my slide now. Please wait, I'll show you my slide now. The slide I prepared for my team. Yes, yes, Zibach. Yeah, of course, that's the main thing, right? Just give me a second. I'll share you the my slides on that. I'll show you my slide. Please wait. Please wait. Where is it? Where is it? Just give me a second. Where is my slide? Yeah, got it. So I'll tell you why this AWS certified security specialist is important. The reason is now. You go to almost. I I told you now when I when I started what happened was when I started what happened was I have seen that only, only there was only one role AWS architecting cloud platform, but now I have seen that you have more than some 200 positions generally in AWS or let's say cloud platform, and every almost some 80 percent of the companies worldwide is moving to cloud partially or completely, so the security is the primary concern that way. that is why security specialty is something which is more in demand, okay. That is why security specialty is more in demand. Even now, what also what happens is, see, you have this corona issue, right? Yes, yes, Amir, we can have the security specialty with our associate. So now also this corona issue came, right? So corona issue came, the most important people in IT now is basically the operations team and the security team. Why? Because if you don't have a proper security team, you cannot manage it, right? That's why. So I'll give an example. See, a few days back, few days means just a very few days back, 
I search for a job requirement in a cloud platform. See this. A very few things I said. I can share you the link also. I can share you the link which I got this. I got these jobs only from just two links. From now create for town, from times job. Just very few links. See this. You have a lot of job requirements. But only thing is, we can get the certification. Certification is very good. See, I I'll give you my words on certification. See this. This is what I I am telling you about certification, especially AWS and the kind of certifications. Don't feel bad, okay? See, this is what my perspective. Uh, correct me if I am wrong, okay? But Krish, those those certification, those cloud terms is vary according to the every yes. uh, vendor course, yes. for that particular cloud. Yes. 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 So there there is always. A Kind of catch where uh, you know nowadays we know that there are the security uh, uh, concerns over the networks and uh, over to the public network. But uh, industry is very versatile nowadays, and one should know yes. that which vendor to go for. Uh, I'll tell you. See, that is basically. I I'll tell you. See, learn AWS. Learning AWS will give you a very much confidence and very much ease for you to learn other platforms. Like once you learn AWS. You don't have to go to any any trainers to learn Azure. Also, you can learn by yourself. Why? Because you you have already have a cloud strategy in mind. Like the same way, if you learn a multi cloud strategy, if you are so much resourcing on that, tomorrow you have any requirements on cloud, you can do it, right? Yeah, that's fine. And I told you, team, getting a certification is just like getting your driving license. This term, this line, I always like. That's why. Why? Because see, just think of it. I have seen a lot of people say I have a lot of certifications. Getting a certification is just like you're driving. Like, that doesn't mean that you are you will be able to drive the vehicle always, right? Getting the driving skill is something which is a different one. That's what I felt basically. You agree with me, right? This is what I felt always. Because yes, you go to yeah, you go to company. You have hundreds of certifications. No use. Of course, yes. For a for a starting, let's say if you go with the certification, you have more priority. But That is just a starting party. I suggest you get the skills very much. Align your skills with the job requirements, current current scenarios. That can give you the benefit. First thing. The second thing is, people ask me, Krish, what happens if I don't have experience in cloud? While you learn things, make sure you learn like you have one year experience. So let's say, for example, we discuss about cloud tray, or let's say we discuss about EC2. I wanted to make sure that. A person who is working in the cloud easy to for the next last one year or two year, that kind of experience you must get while you learn from this. And people nowadays don't look for the super experienced guys. People want to have the guys who is sensible and who have a skill set and who want to improve continuously. And understand that either you go to AWS or any cloud platform, companies can prefer multi cloud strategy. That is why I always suggest learn a cloud platform first. Go through the other platforms also. That I will give you support if you want, no problem. So you can just basically go through other platforms to get an overview. So tomorrow when you get a requirement, you must be able to choose which is the best one. Okay? Then I told you the strategy is very important. Strategy means how to design a cloud platform. The strategy is very important. Like the things we discussed in CCSP and all. Like the same way tactics, how to do it effectively is also very important. So. These things you have to always keep in mind. This is my suggestions for you. This will give you more and more ideas of how to work or how to plan your flight journey. Okay, that's it. And I'll give you just an overview of the AWS Certified Security Specialty. So AWS Certified Security Specialty is one of the best certifications which you can get in the market now. Okay, in this you will have these things in mind. Okay, you have to understand these points. Okay, understand that you have a you have a cost of three hundred dollars for the exam. Okay. For every security for every specialty exam, you have a cost of three hundred dollars. See this, and of course the passing score is almost seven fifty out of thousand. Exam is simple, team. I don't want to just confuse you. The exam is very simple. Okay, I'll tell you how to learn for that. So, and for this, as I told you, we have a total of five domains. For the AWS certified security specialist, you have five domains. So you have to go through these five domains in depth. So in this we will study about VPC and all. Here we will study about logging and monitoring. Likewise, you have to go through all these in depth. There is no reappearance team. There is no reappear reappearance. That means that 
one once you prepare for the exam there is no second shot as for now maybe you will get it sometime but as for now it's not there okay see we have total five domains in this you can either choose any domain okay that's it yeah that's it that's it you don't have to worry about like for example when you choose any vendor right dwls or azure or google or any vendor it's very simple thing even last time also right i have a i have a batch running for aws security now so i made the team take the oracle certification also without giving any support i just forced them i wanted them to take the oracle certification also and to my to my uh, i am so amazed that these guys had a lot very good enthusiasm a lot of people took the certification it's very simple to do that don't worry only thing is you learn the strategy very much you can do that no problem it's very simple you can do that so uh, no, uh, ajay basically i am currently i am having the batch only for combo why because uh, they are getting more requests so i am it taking for 50 hours dheeraj you can take the exam you can retake the exam after some 30 days for after first exam once you fail if you fail but you will not fail seriously you will not fail okay don't worry exam failing is nothing you will not fail okay that's it and see for every let's like say for example for domain 1 for domain 1 you have to yeah sure ajay you can just ping me i hope you have my number you can ping me no problem what i suggest is okay learn learning is very important get more skills be ready to do the labs be ready to get your hands on you will be able to pass for sure so in in the security specialty we have a domain one called as incident response that's a very important point team let's say if there is a incident let's say for example your company is suffering a security issue let's say for example you have your credentials lost you have your some kind of issues compromise something in that case how you have to respond to it like this you have to see which all topics you have to study in that make a proper plan that's all so in domain through you will see these services how do you if effectively have a monitoring so why monitoring why monitoring because unless otherwise you have a visibility to your infrastructure unless otherwise you have a visibility over your platform unless otherwise you have a visibility over your management perspective you cannot have a proper administration that is why we we basically configure these kind of services so that we have a clear visibility of exactly what is happening in the cloud platform so i want you to go to all this understand this service is very much tell me that and if nowadays we use machine learning also in said machine learning and all lot of things like that and domain 3 is basically more about okay sorry wrong window what is it yeah domain 3 is basically more about these things the vpc vpc concept the application firewall which is the layer 7 firewall ids ips securing the database or data ddos protection api security those kind of things and all we'll discuss all these things but we we'll discuss all these things in the security perspective okay i want it more on security perspective so you have to learn this plus you have to learn security perspective also and domain 4 i to and this is the domain which i take most time but people say that okay krish we can finish this domain in 1 hour or 2 hour but i take it at least for 2 to 3 classes why because this particular domain is something which you have to learn in depth you also felt the same right managing the identities managing the users in the cloud is very strategic right who can access what who can who can do what if i don't have a proper restriction for managing the cloud platform if i don't have a proper visibility of the cloud platform i cannot do anything that's why i basically have a proper authentication and authorization i have a proper identity and access management so this i have to take a long time basically it's a huge thing and after that finally securing the data no waf basically enable debug if you want to have advanced waf configuration you have to do it by you have to do it by yourself you have to pay for the service and you have to do it by yourself okay and finally we have data protection where we have a key files how to manage the key files securely how to encrypt the data how to make sure all your things are encrypted properly and all okay that's it this is all about the certification team and team if you want to learn more about the aws certified security specialty and all i'll share you my if you want if you want i can share you my webinar details you can get it from the in youtube channel i can share the info screen link on that also please wait let me share the link on that youtube channel you can get that uh, please wait please wait team to pad for aws certified security specialty please wait team 
No. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Every people is asking me the same question, team. Do we have to have some real coding skills for this? Do, do we have to have some coding skills for it? What I am saying is, if you want to prepare the AWS certification, I don't suggest, I don't suggest you must have a coding skill. But still, but still, what I suggest is, what I, what I suggest is, you must have a coding skill. But that is not like you have to, you know, uh, do it, the coding from the scratch and all. I can, I can teach you the very simple methods where you have to understand the code, that's all. I don't, I just want you to understand the code. I don't want you to understand the complete platform or something like that, or like the complete coding or something like that. See team, you can use this YouTube link to see my old webinar of security. Okay, that's it. So hope it's clear for you. Anyone queries team? Uh, uh, one last query, Krish. Uh, yeah, tell me, tell me. Uh, when, when we say the logs and monitoring, so okay. how do we monitor our uh, network uh, with Amazon? So is it the same console or they're using some other NMS or monitoring system? The same too? console, the same console. But still, if you want to integrate some third-party tools, it's possible. But as for now, we're using the same console. Like, for example, we have services called as CloudWatch. See? We have services called as CloudWatch here. We can have services called as CloudTrail. A lot of things like that. So we can basically use CloudWatch. We can basically use CloudTrail. We can use a lot of platforms or for this. So by integrating the CloudWatch, CloudTrail, Config, Network Visibility, by combining all this together, we can basically make sure we don't miss anything in the cloud platform. Okay? Just give me a second. Yeah. Just give me a second. This guy is basically acting weird today. I don't know what happened. I think they are upgrading the console actually. Uh, Deepak, you can do one thing. Uh, that that I am completely clear very much in the, you know, the particular webinar. You will see that topic by topic. Okay. So just go to the webinar. Okay. Because even every service is basically for security. Like for example, whether you take uh, whether you take the identity access management, whether you take secrets manager, guard duty, all these services can aid for security. You have some more than 50 services which can aid you in service security. That's why I suggest uh, when you plan for a security strategy, when you plan for a security strategy in your company, you have to consider which all services you want to use. It's different for different companies, but some services will be common. Like for example, when you're using the CloudWatch and all, it is common for all the companies. Except some few services, all the other services are based on the company only. Clear? Yeah, perfect. Uh, Krish, uh, I have one question. Okay. Um, if, if we want to compare the, the cost of okay. running VMs uh, okay. between AWS, Azure and Google Cloud, which one is okay. like uh, cheaper and cost effective? Yeah, that is based on the type of VM you're running. So sometimes I have seen that when you run some Windows VMs, Windows Server VMs and all, Azure can be very much cheaper. But when you run some higher configurations, AWS can be cheaper. That depends always. That purely always depends. Okay? Okay. Yeah. Because why? But but still, I felt that, okay, for Windows VMs and all, we can go for Azure. Azure is very much cheaper than that. But when you go for uh, some kind of features and some kind of availability security factors, we can go for AWS. If you want, see, let's say, I will give an example. Let's say we have a service called as Amazon S3. So you cannot compare Amazon S3 with anything else. Why? Because the best service that is available in the market now is Amazon S3. Okay? okay. That's it. Okay. And, and this and security, uh, whatever the services, I mean, the company or organization you know, enrolled for the cloud uh, resource in the AWS, so it's okay. most likely the organization responsibility, but uh, whatever AWS has its own security for its cloud services. But in between, yes. the organization has the responsibility to take care of all these secure things based on the resources they're uh, going to use. Uh, no, like I'll just see, there is a word called as shared responsibility. Shared security responsibility means when I say the security is basically, okay, you have to understand what all things are provided by AWS, what all things are provided by, or what all things you have to keep in mind. Like this, whenever you talk, take any service, understand that 
in that service what all security perspectives is taken care by aws automatically what all things you have to take care okay like that plan your responsibility that's all got it Great, thank you yeah sales compliance of the cloud and compliance in the cloud it's basically different you can go through the webinar also like for example uh, you can go through my webinar which i share in the chat box also and ping me if you have doubts no problem we can discuss and that's the team no doubts anything and team don't forget if you have any doubt just ping me on personally okay and i hope you got my you got my linkedin linkedin link you got my uh, webinar session recording and you got my contact number also if you are in support you can just ping me and one more thing team last one more thing make sure uh, you just fill the feedback form we will get a certificate from infosec train which contains some cpu also i think okay that's it and i hope this session was useful for you if you have any concerns anything yeah i'll share no problem if you have any concerns any problem just ping me okay i can support you on that okay that's it feel free to contact me i can support you on that uh, can you just send, uh, can somebody share my linkedin link again once in chat box i think i have opened it again please wait just give me a second yeah perfect please wait team please wait just one more thing please wait uh for certificate yeah thank you thank you anand that's exactly that's it yeah so for certificate you will get it from your e in your email also only okay no problem so get it in your email okay that's it yes feedback feedback form also i shared do you want to share once again okay i'll share i'll share please wait please wait team i'll share the feedback form once again link if you please wait please wait don't worry all the sessions you will get the session recording link and everything you will get in, the, in that particular you are the thing you said the certificate everything you will get there please wait i'll share the feedback link those who didn't fill you can fill this please wait i'm sharing it to you now you can fill this feedback form okay yeah you can pick the start and end date also no problem Okay, Sim. Thank you so much. Hope you enjoy the session. Okay, we can ping yes, your please. feedback in the chat. Oh. Yeah, perfect. You can ping your uh, suggestions on the WhatsApp also. Yeah. 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 Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. You can ping your feedback on the WhatsApp also. Thank you, team. Just want to know how much you are interested. Perfect. Sure, 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 buddy. Sure, no problem. Thank you, great. Thank you, team. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, team. Bye, team. Thank you.